My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Monday, March 27th, 2017. I'm here with John Rusquet at his office at the UJA Federation in New York City, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. John, do I have your permission to record this interview? You have my permission. Nice Excellent. to see you, Jane. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly your involvement in the New York Chavarah, and then the impact that the Chavarah had on your own life and on the larger Jewish community beyond. I'd like to start by talking about your personal and family background and to flesh out a bit who you were at the time that you got involved in the New York Chavarah. Let's begin with your family. When you were growing up, you were born in 1946 in New York, New York City? Born in 1946, Far Rockaway, New York City. Okay. Um, so you described your family as a quintessential two-civilization family. Can you tell us about your family when you were growing up, starting with your parents? Well, I would say my grandparents were quintessential two-civilization uh, two civilization family. Um, and that's my paternal grandparents. Um, to illustrate that, they had a wonderful home in Lawrence. They had been founders of Congregation Sharatefilla, where Rabbi Rackman and others served as rabbi. Uh, so I have recollections of going to their home for Shabbat dinner on Friday night. And then we would return for Sunday dinner, which was Sunday lunch. All sorts of people would be there on occasion. Mordechai Kaplan, Henrietta Zold on one occasion. People would come down. And after Sunday dinner, which was Sunday lunch, we would go to the living room. I remember as a kid, hard velvet couches. And my grandfather, Cecil B. Ruskay, would recite Shakespeare, Shelley, and Keats by heart. So these were people deeply involved in Jewish life. My, I had two great aunts who were national presidents of Adassa. My great-grandmother, Esther J. Ruskay, was published by the Jewish Publication Society in 1901. Published in? A in book, I have it here, called Home and Hearth Essays. Uh, and by the way, is this it? No, it's not, that's not it. I can find it. Yep. But I mean, there are chapters on Shabbat. There are chapters on intermarriage. There is chapter, 1901. It's one of the first years of the Jewish Publication Society. So that was my great-grandmother. Um, my grandmother was very involved in Jewish founding of a synagogue, modern Orthodox, and ran for the state assembly on the American Labor Party in 1948 and carried the five towns. So this was a family involved in Jewish life, involved in the broader culture. My grandmother would go to New York and... Uh, read, I mean, this is like from another world, read Shakespeare and other things to prisoners. Um, so they were, they were a two-civilization. And my other great-grandparents were involved in founding the Society for the Advancement of Judaism with Kaplan. Also on your father's side. On my father's side. And actually, the SAJ on West 86th Street was the home of a great-uncle, an Unterberg, it's two brownstones put together, the SAJ. So there were deep roots there, but my parents would, I would say, were generation skipping. What was your mother's background? My mother, um, it was very, very reform. My grandmother was born in Hoosick Falls, New York. That's east of Albany. Also, all my grandparents went to college. Um, but it was very reform. Uh, she, when she was growing up, she was a member of Temple Israel of Lawrence, but a pretty reformed synagogue. Reformed to the point that my, grand, my maternal grandmother and her sister, who lived together for many years, had a Christmas tree. And we had a Christmas tree growing up, my memories of a Christmas tree, till I was five, six, seven, and with stockings and the whole bit. But when my parents were home, we'll come back to that, my parents' life, my parents were wonderful. Everett and Edith Ruskay, let me acknowledge them. Um, I would say they, uh, my father was a businessman, uh, had his own shirt company, uh, traveled therefore, but his loves were, had not, he had not gone to college, felt bad about that, his brothers and sisters did, and, um, but he was 
autodidact, so he was into opera and culture and boards and skiing and sailing. So I grew up a wonderful, they called it upper middle class, it was not rich as we know it today, but it was sailing and skiing. So if we were home for Friday night, my parents would light candles and my father would recite Kiddush and Eishas Chayel in English. But they were three times a year Jews in synagogue. I mean, synagogue was not their thing. They went on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I don't think Jewish life was a deep, it was not a deep part of their life. Um, were they involved politically? Yeah, I mean, they were involved, um, they were involved liberally in, in liberal politics, left politics for a long time. I mean, I don't know if, I don't think they were a member of the Communist Party, but they were certainly, at that point, they were progressive, pro-union, anti-fascist. I mean, many of their friends had been in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade in the Spanish Civil War. There would be parties there of those folk. Um, there were books in the 50s that were put in the attic. But basically, they were liberal Democrats. Mm -hmm. So very involved in Allard Lowenstein's, my mother was Allard Lowenstein's congressional campaign in 1968, involved in Women's Strike for Peace. I went to anti-Vietnam War demonstrations with my parents, um, very pro-civil rights. And I think my parents had great compassion for the people left out. Um, Did they connect that to Jewish values, do you think? No, I think they connected to liberal values. They liberal American values. Liberal American values. Roosevelt, pro-union, anti-fascist. Um, yeah. So it was a wonderful family. And um, what did, did your mother work? My mother did not work. She was a uh, she, you know, volunteered. She was a, a Boy Scout troop leader or whatever that was. She was a good parent, and my grandparents were around. Um, <clears throat> you have siblings. I have a wonderful sister, Judy. Uh, she's four years older than I am, although I refer to her now as my younger sister, but that's a joke. She's great. We live nearby, near one another, or quite close. She's a psychologist, has a PhD in psychology, and her specialization is eating disorders. Um, now she's, I'm 70 and a half, she's almost 75. She still has a practice, but she's spending a lot of time with grandkids. Um, and I don't think Jewish life, she went to Hebrew school as I did. It was not a significant place for her. But because of my involvement, she's become connected to some of the more interesting places in Jewish life. But I don't, wouldn't call it deep tissue. So you grew up in the, in the five towns. Five towns. Explain what the five towns is. So the five towns are, there are, um, I don't know how it got the name, but the five towns are Lawrence, Cedarhurst, Woodmere, Hewlett and Inwood. And they're right across the border from eastern Queens on the south shore by the beaches. Although Long Beach is a little closer and Lido Beach, there are five towns there. When I was growing up, we had a, at one point in our earliest home, we had a quarter of an acre that you were growing corn. And, and uh, my mother, by the way, was a gardener, president of the gardening club, and gardening was an important thing. So gardening, sailing, skiing, opera, ballet, music. It was theater. It was a, a reading. Um, my grandfather was a poet. The poetry books were around a lot. He was a lawyer, but uh, that was his love. So in some ways it was a wonderful... Um, uh, I went... I was on the... Um, went to Hebrew school at Temple Bethel of Cedarhurst didn't quite grab me. Excuse me, the Hebrew school didn't grab me, but the synagogue grabbed me a what, bit. What was the Jewish community like in, the, in these five towns? And which town did you live in? Well, I grew up in Cedarhurst, but my parents, excuse me, I grew I, my first years was, I was in Hewlett, I think, and then my parents moved to Cedarhurst, and then we moved to Woodmere, right near Hewlett Bay Park. So they moved around a bit, but this is all within three miles. I would call it suburban. Most of the people, mo many of the people there were people that had moved from Brooklyn and out to the suburbs. My parents, as you heard, my parents met at Woodmere Academy. It was both of my parents grew up out there. And their friends, therefore, were people, many of them from Woodmere Academy, a private school there, where, so they felt that they were, 
had been there longer. They were the more established. As people came out from Brooklyn and Queens to live in a uh, sort of a nicer suburb. Um, and as that happened, synagogues were created. And now they had been there. I don't know the history of the synagogues in the five towns, but when I grew up, <clears throat> well, or the, or the life I grew up in, there were on the one hand very strong synagogues with very charismatic, strong rabbis. Uh, I mean, I could, Rabbi Emanuel Rackman at Sharadafilla, um, at uh, Beth Shalom, Rabbi Clapperman, Gil Clapperman, at Temple Beth El of Cedars, Rabbi Eddie Sandrow, at Temple Sons of Israel, Rabbi Irving Miller. I mean, I could tell you all the things these people did beyond their synagogues. They were strong, they were basically progressive, they spoke out. Um, and these synagogues were affiliated with? Reform, conservative, orthodox. I, I just mentioned to you several, uh, Gil, uh, Rabbi, there was another Temple Israel, which is a reform synagogue, and there was a split off of the synagogue. And the, and so the, the full, ra a full yeah, range. the full range. But it was kind of suburban Judaism of the fifties. Uh, you know, what we see today: you go to a synagogue, conservative synagogue, certainly an Orthodox synagogue, on Sukkot, everybody brings a, a lulav and an esrog. Trust me, at Temple Beth El of Cedarhurst, there was one lulav and esrog. It was in the synagogue, maybe two. And at the appropriate times, it got passed around. I'm using that as an example. Um, Jewish life has just changed so much, uh, forgetting that the five towns, obviously, has now become, for the most part, particularly Lawrence and, and now Cedars, a modern Orthodox, an Orthodox stronghold. Uh, that was not the case then. So the synagogue you belong to was? A conservative synagogue. Conservative. <clears throat> Rabbi Eddie Sandra was down the block from where I was in Cedarhurst. Uh, we go to Hebrew school there. Mm -hmm. and, and say a little bit more about the, the Jewish environment in your home. What, 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 um, well, the first years, and I still remember it in Cedarhurst, we had a Christmas tree. But there was also Hanukkah, and we go to a Pesach Seder. But I didn't know anything about Kashrus for Pesach. In other words, on Pesach, there was matzah on the table. I mean, my mother would make haroset, and there would be maror. But I didn't have a, our house was not kosher. I didn't have a clue about kashrus for Pesach. Um, I mean, later, it doesn't matter. Later, you know, my mother would go to a bakery, and there'd be some kind of kosher for Pesach, like something there. You know, in other words, I mean, they were assimilating Jews. I mean, that's what, you know, uh, that's where American Jewry was at. Right. Did your friends' families have Christmas trees also? No. I know very, none of them. But my grandparents, my, gra my maternal grandmother and her sister did until the end of their life. They loved it. So you started to mention your Jewish education a bit. You went to Hebrew school? <clears throat> so I started going to Hebrew school, which I didn't love. But I do recall something that I liked about the synagogue, going to synagogue on occasion. I liked the spirit in it, the feeling in it, the, uh, the quiet. And I would say my mother, till the end of her life, told a, an interesting story. And this took place before we, I was seven or eight. And she would remember that, because I'd go to synagogue and occasionally with my parents on my holidays, like sit, I remember sitting on my father's lap in the third row looking in the auxiliary service, but seeing the senior rabbi preach. And my mother would tell the story that I would put a bathrobe on, put a bureau out at the top of the stairs, and pretend I was a rabbi. And this is when I was five, six, or seven. So something was touching you. And even though I didn't like Hebrew school. Were you a student? Did you like school? I liked school once I got to college and graduate school. I mean, I, I, high school was not, okay. I mean, if so, I. But you weren't, uh, the, I mean, the, the fact that you didn't love Hebrew school. Was not, right. I didn't like, but I mean, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, I don't know. I was not a great student in uh, all the way until college. Um, I flunked chemistry in high school. I almost flunked ma uh, trig, and I didn't understand why did I lead to, need to learn the trig of 36. 
Like why? Um, I loved history and did well. I liked literature. Um, but I didn't like science and math. And did you like Hebrew? No, I didn't love it. And I'm not a great language student. I'll come back to that because it actually affected my graduate studies. So I didn't love Hebrew. Um, so I didn't love Hebrew school, but I was attracted and did become the, the, the rabbi of the, of the junior congregation. Well, I don't know when that was, actually. It would be interesting. I could check it out with a dear friend of mine who it was probably in high school. It was probably, I liked conducting services, and I remember doing that for teen services during the high holidays. And I liked, uh, and during high school, a dear friend of mine, Eddie Schechter, now a rabbi, reform, reform rabbi, and I studied with our senior rabbi, uh, Mishnah. So, well, but that was later. So um, I didn't love Hebrew school, and conjugating verbs was not my, you know, gamarti, gamarta, gamar, it was not my cup of tea. Um, and then I had a bar mitzvah. And I remember learning that, and learning how to put on talus and tefillin, and et cetera. Did you learn the trope? Or did you learn from a record? I, I learned it from a record at that point, um, or whatever, a recording. And I mean, I did, and my parents, to their credit, they didn't do big things, nothing at night. We had a luncheon in the synagogue. I mean, they, they didn't believe in that. Um, and then, in fact, embarrassingly, because my friends were there, but people like my grandfather and uncles, as they'd write things like a poem or this. So that was, of course, a bit embarrassing. Like in front, everybody else had fancy parties. I mean, there was a quality, I should say, about growing up in the five towns. And I'll just add one more thing, since we're creating an archive here. So my parents had good values in a lot of things. So everybody else had gardeners, but my parents loved gardening. So the other mothers would be in high heels and whatever, and my, grand, my parents were in their jeans out there creating beautiful gardens. Everybody else had wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. My parents had antique oriental rugs. As a kid, you don't know. There were houses we'd go to, and I'm, again, I'm not judging anything, that had plastic through the living room and plastic. And of course, my parents would have none, none of that. What do you mean by plastic? Plastic the covering room? the carpet or covering the uh, furniture. furniture. So, and my parents were into politics. I mean, in a serious way. An opera, and my father would sit on a Saturday afternoon and listen to the opera and cry. And I was sent, by the way, from a young kid, the Five Towns Music and Art Foundation, every year. I think it was like eight. You'd go to two at Carnegie Hall, or two at the opera, and two at the ballet. As the youngest kid, when young, the first thing I'd do was check in how many intermissions. Well, I'm an opera lover now. And um, so, and we played a lot of sports. Um, I mean, my parents were on National Ski Patrol. What is that? Well, you, you know, skiing has their ski patrol, which take people off the mountain if they have a fall. So you have to be trained for that. You have first aid, but not only first aid, you have to know how to take put a patient, put a patient, put a skier who's had a break on a toboggan and take them down off the mountain. So my parents went skiing every weekend. They had a place near Bel Air, New York. Bel Air was a big ski, a ski place. And uh, I, we went with them. So skiing, you know, we say, skiing, was, is an, skiing and sailing, there are a lot of different worlds. And skiing is a world, trust me. You get home Sunday night zonked, and by Tuesday, what are the ski conditions? And, and you're planning to go up on Friday. And you have a whole life up there, and other people up there, and kids up there. So skiing was a whole life. Uh, sailing was a life. My father was Commodore of the Yacht Club. I grew up racing lightnings. Um, walking the beach was even in the dead of winter. And as a kid, I mean, playing football between the telephone poles. You know, I mean, you played football and basketball, and I was on a number of teams. Little League, I was on... Uh, the high school freshman football team and baseball team, and uh, a very full life. It was a wonderful life, and very lucky. Um, and that that great those great athletic careers ended when my life changed with Camp Ramah.
because I couldn't play on Shabbat. So how did you get to Camp Romano? How old were you when you first went? Um, so the day I was bar mitzvah, Shemini Atzeret, 1959. And um, I, afterwards, everybody's hugging kids, whatever, we walked to the lobby on the way to the luncheon, and a guy who I didn't know well but a peer named Eddie Schechter, I spoke about this when I received an honorary doctorate at HUC. And um, I don't know if you saw that talk, but you might want to. It's about the four things that changed my life. I didn't see it. It's a very interesting talk. And um, Eddie Schechter comes up to me and says, you're great. God, you are really good. You should go to Camp Ramah. What, what was he? He was a peer. He's my age. But what was he pointing to? What was well, he? The bar mitzvah. You mean the way you handled The way it? I did it, the way I handled it. We barely knew each other. And you should go to Camp Ramah. What's Camp Ramah? And then somehow the rabbi encouraged it. The associate rabbi was asked to leave Hebrew school one day. The associate rabbi playing basketball in the backyard, back of it, said, why don't you go to Camp Ramah? You know, you'd, you'd be great there. And so there was an active effort, by the way, of conservative movement there to encourage people to go to Ramah. And I go to Camp Ramah that summer. So I go in 19, my bar mitzvah was in Shemini Atzeret, 59. I don't get there until 61. So I don't, can't tell you why so was it. You were like 14, 14 yeah, maybe turning 14, 15. Yeah, 14, right. Mm -hmm. And Ramah, you know, Ramah changed my life. And I've written about this a great deal and spoken about it. I mean, what was it about Ramah? Well, what was it? Uh, thanks for asking. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, and we went to a total dump of the camp. It was Camp Ramah in Nyack, which was then a sleepaway camp. Where's Nyack? Nyack is an hour from New York, right by the Tappan Zee Bridge. A dump of a camp. And it was its opening summer. So there was nothing, the ball field wasn't ready, tennis courts weren't ready. We played stoop ball. But a wonderful group of people, and what I remember, I mean, then, this was 1961 Ramah, <clears throat> there was a lot of Hebrew spoken. I don't want to say it was only Hebrew, but you know, if you, in the dining room, you were expected to speak Hebrew to get the milk or whatever, and, um, and we had services every morning, and then we had classes. Come, I can come back to the classes. Um, and then was sports and theater. And what's most powerful for me was not that uh, the Hebrew plays, Gevir Tihana Ava, my fair lady, Amar Ha'el, Shebizayat Apayim, Nachalach Menuim Gam Lechem Dal, Avalin Li Yislach Shochen, Shamaim Az, Imchat Sidibat Mazal. Anyway, that was uh, get me to the church on time, in case. Um, <laughs> Well, get me to the Beit Knesset on time. Um, what I, what struck me, and I, I've always said, touched my heart and soul, was Shabbat there. The preparing for Shabbat, quieting down Shabbat afternoon, cleaning the bunk, then going often to beautiful prayer services that I didn't even understand the words that were being said then. But the tone of Kabbalat Shabbat, of the introductory service on Shabbat, I just thought it was the most beautiful thing I had ever experienced. I always had, and it not only seared my soul, I think I learned there that I had a soul and a heart. And I, was, I don't think I really knew that. I experienced it there. And it just, whoa. And maybe I was a young adolescent, 14, there was, I'll come back, there was also something else about Ramah, but I just, this was an enhanced way to be on the planet. And a very Jewish way. Retrospectively, <coughs> excuse me, I think I was experiencing Kedusha, a sense of the holy. And that generated a journey that led me to deepen that, 
youth groups, later uh, Israel trip, 63, went to Israel for the first time, came back in 64 to Ramah as staff, 65 to Israel as staff. So the group experience, Shabbat, observance, Shabbat tefillah, prayer, um, I experienced it as an enhanced way to be on the planet. And I think from then on, I mean, so much of my whole, I think my whole professional life has been about how can we increase the numbers who participate in what I call inspired Jewish community? I call that inspired Jewish community and help transform our, what, our gateway institutions to be inspired places. So many of our gateway institutions, in my opinion, had become devoid of Katusha. In the, in, the, in the thrust, in the rush to assimilation, in the rush to, in the rush to acculturation, let us build large synagogues, Jewish, Christian, you don't have to find meaning there. Just if you want to acculturate and become a good American, Christians were members of churches, you should be a member of a synagogue. It wasn't, um, someone once said recently, if American Judaism could survive the synagogue of the, the suburban synagogue of the 50s, it could survive anything. And um, so I think everything I've done in all the positions has been um, how do we help transform our institutions, which requires participatory Judaism, not being, act not being spectators, but getting involved in creating Jewish communities that work and helping to transform, you know, transform gateway institutions and increase people, increase the percentage of people that participate in them. So what was it about Ramah in that, those early years that actually created community? That, what, what was it about it? Well, first of all, I would add another element. So one was the tefillah and the prayer. And were you fluent enough in the, in the liturgy? Not at first, not at first. I mean, I have a memory, which I've joked about, of, um, joked, that at some point, I probably second summer, I agreed to read Torah uh, at Mincha on Shabbat. And it was a disaster. Uh, now, by then, by then, I was probably reading Torah back at the synagogue or in other things, but somehow I either didn't prepare adequately or not, I got nervous. And there was, I will not mention, but a, a very traditional um, uh, le volunteer leader who was there for Shabbat and kind of never forgot. <laughs> and it was a bit humiliating. Um, but from that, I should come back. And there was also at Ramah, <clears throat> as a teenager, two, th I, two things I remember. One, there was a sense that this was an ideological, educational idea, educational experiment. There was a Professor Schwab from the University of Chicago and C Professor Seymour Fox and that crowd were all imbued with bringing that method and testing it. And that involved the notion that the way we relate to each other. So there was a notion of relating to one another with kavod, with respect, of listening to one another. Um, and there should be, and I forget it precisely, but there should be the nurturing madrich, and there should be the challenging force as well, so that you'd be challenged and nurtured. And I have memories also of sort of sitting endlessly, one-on-one, -on -one with both peers, having heartfelt adolescent conversations about important things. Well, the combination of tefillah for the first time, I mean, I, I liked it. I mean, I, there's nothing Did else. Did you learn to daven there? I learned to daven there. I learned and I liked it. I mean, com let me, compared to many, I would say even most, my Hebrew skills were weak. So I was never that often a baltfila, <coughs> a prayer leader. But I came, the first summers, I came to like it. I liked putting on tefillin. I liked, uh, trust me, I felt like I was in relationship to God. And I felt, and the feeling wasn't there always. But in Shabbat, and Abdullah, I never said Abdullah. It was wonderful. 
I mean, by the way, I'm, I'll make it here. I'm not coming out. I've just concluded I'm making a capital gift to Camp Ramon Nayak. And I'm making it in memory of my parents. Because when I came home and said we have to have kosher, have to be a kosher place, they didn't say take a walk. They didn't say, when you have your house, yeah, they could have done a lot of things. They were totally supportive. Did they become... No, they had separate stuff, and I wasn't that... They had separate stuff, but they had... They continued, but when I was there, or... Actually, this was also when I went to rabbinical... I went to rabbinical school for a year, and uh, in both settings, they would accommodate me. I would not call it, call it halachically midaktik, um, but it was obviously an attempt to be supportive. Um, so what else was it? Loved playing baseball in Hebrew, Kador Basis. Loved the plays in Hebrew. In Hebrew. Um, but I think it was the tone and the soul and the heart. So that, you also got involved from this with USY. So from that, I went back, and got involved with USY became quickly a regional officer and then a national officer. So you, between USY and Rama, and I got involved with LTF, which was Leaders Training Fellowship. And I was in Hebrew high school. So Jewish life, so in fact, my freshman year, which is right around, my parents moved from Cedarhurst to uh, Woodmere. And I went to Hewlett High School, but my life was outside of Hewlett High School. My life was, was USY, Ramah, LTF, the synagogue. Um, I mean, I've recently gone to high school reunions and actually chatted about this with people, and they never thought I was out as I felt. Now, as an adolescent at high school, and I never did very well. I mean, there were, so all these folks were acing it, and I was flunking chemistry. And, you know, it was a very, I mean, the people who have come from, Places like Lawrence at Hewlett High School have done great things, you know. Um, but I'm pleased I am on the Hewlett High School Hall of Fame wall. <laughs> but I, it was certainly not for the academics, nor how I felt at the place then. Um, Did USY do it for you in the sense of giving you that sense of community and providing Shabbats sort of throughout the year? Well, I would say the Israel trips, that was a whole other experience. So that was 1963. 63, I go for the first time to Israel. On pilgrimage. With USY uh, pilgrimage. And that was, I mean, I mean, you, you asked me the question about USY. I'll come back to that. Because I was, my first roles were social action chairman. This was Kennedy, civil rights. So I was able to bring that. Uh, to uh, USY, and that was, I was also, uh, I learned Israeli dance at Ramah, and Haiti B'chug Rikud B'machanero, I was in the dance group, and um, I mean, what, I, I did not, as others, I mean, throw myself into textual study. Hebrew language. Eddie Schechter, I mentioned, he went to Ramah in the Poconos. Every time he he heard a Hebrew word that he didn't know, he walked around with a notebook. He's a cool guy. And he wrote it down. Impressive. Um, so, what did USY... I mean, I'm thinking, you ask an interesting question. Because Shabbat at at, I mean, I, we went to many regional retreats. It was a different thing. Uh, at regional retreats and other synagogues. I think I was just embracing Jewish life. Yeah. How, did, how did your first experience of being in Israel affect you? Was that, t that pilgrimage 63, was, was your was first time? So you were like... Uh, 63, 60. I was uh, 3, 13, 17. 16, 17. I, I'm, I'm in August... So it's uh, 16, 17. Fell in love with the place. I thought it was... Um, I thought it uh, just represented 
everything I could imagine was progressive. It was sexy. It was idealistic, kibbutzim. It was an amazing miracle that, uh, so, I mean, when 63 was 13 and, and 48, uh, 16 years, I mean, it was this young state. And yet, uh, I remember in 65 when I came back to staff, we went to the, there was an international Jewish youth convention. And I went, I was a national officer of USY at the time, so I went, Ben-Gurion spoke. In Israel. In Israel, I met Ben-Gurion. I mean, but holding aside, government, it was so impressive what was being created. And I just took the whole narrative and, and uh, imbibed it. And I felt that in 65. Uh, Israeli Arabs could vote, they could participate. If it wasn't for those Arabs, armies that wanted to eliminate us in 48, thank God in 56, our military and the soldiers were so impressive. And it, um, I had mean, your, I just, Had your parents been involved no. in Zionism at all, or Israel? Had they been to Israel? No, they had not. <clears throat> they went once. I probably gone 95 times, you know. Um, they weren't a big time. I mean, I do remember early uh, watching a movie about the creation of Israel, like Hill 42 or something, and something with the word Hill, and my parents sort of tearing up. So they weren't anti at all. They were supportive, and I had, and and my father's mother was very uh, involved in Hadassah and great aunts were national presidents of Hadassah and. So there was a kind of Zionist, ex I mean, let me put it this way. No one knew there was a dark side then. It was just light, right after the Holocaust. This was right after Eichmann was 63 in the trial. So all I mean, was there was happening. no, and people were proud of it, and there was, but there was no counter. Um, So Israel just reinforced it. So all these things reinforced. Um, but that said, you know, it's interesting. I'm just thinking out loud with you. Um, but I went off. So I didn't do very well in high school. I had pretty good boards and applied to colleges. And, and everybody, if you high school, everybody went to college. And... Uh, and got rejected for my first three, and then got rejected for my next three. It's now May. I wasn't in college. I wasn't um, in college, and there was no anxiety. It's, it's amazing, and my parents were fine with it. Um, and eventually, I applied to. So I had started at like Brandeis and Western Reserve and Wash U or something. Got rejected from all of them. Anyway, now I was down to the University of Pittsburgh, New Paltz, and Hofstra. And got accepted to all three of them. And University of Pittsburgh sounded more serious. So I went to the University of Pittsburgh. I'd never been there. Knew nothing about it. I sort of liked the idea of being in a city. <clears throat> and went there. And had a fabulous time there. But I would not say... Uh, well, I'll make two comments. You know, I... I spoke a little earlier that I never felt kind of in my high school. So when I went off to college, I said, I'd like to sort of feel more part of the whole thing, whatever that meant. Not every bit. I mean, I went to this place as opposed to what happens today. Eddie Schechter, I mentioned to you, and my dear friend Peter Geffen, who had been national president of, these were my close friends, they drove me to Kennedy. and Through, put me, through USY? Yeah, and but we were dear friends by then put me on a plane, I went out there, got on a cab, and went to the, where's the University of Pittsburgh? I mean, it's not like anybody took me there, et cetera. I just went. And um, it was six, so this was September of 64, and I loved it. 64. Uh, just, first of all, I loved it academically. I, first class in world history, and philosophy. I felt my head being stretched. Terrific teachers. What did you major in? Uh, I basically majored in political science and history. And, uh, I mean, skipping ahead a little, but not too far. I mean, if Camp Ramah was the first place that changed my life, 
The second place was, of course, in the Middle East in 1967 with a fabulous professor named Richard Cottam. Richard who? Cottam, C-O-T-T-A-M, who was a wonderful teacher because it was the 60s in Vietnam so I had take courses in Asian politics and African, South American, and history, Russian history, etc. And then I took a course in Middle East. And the first, it was three times a week, so the first X, most of it, was learning about the Middle East, and I found drawn to it. And then the last month, the last eight sessions, were a simulated conference on Arab-Israeli. And I learned there that there were multiple narratives so this is 1966 or seven, and um, I was at first angry, like how come the Middle East? How come in the middle? I was at Ramah, U.S.Y., right in the middle of the community, and they couldn't put on some of the gray. And so, meaning that it had been presented as black, black and white. white, good and evil. And um, so the land without a people for a people without a land. Exactly. And so that sent me on a whole, you know, ultimately I get a PhD in Arabic politics and the pursuit of Middle East, excuse me, the pursuit of serious Israel education and Middle East reconciliation, if not peace, have become central components of my life. Um, so you felt angry, you were saying? Furious. Angry, but not furious, but angry. And, uh, and I really... Um, Did you feel disrespected? No, I didn't do that. You mean by the community? I, I, I was angry that the community presented it in black and white terms, good and evil. Um, Why did you think that was? I'm sorry, what? Why? Why do you think they presented it that way? Well, the, the tendency of all governments and all is to present things black and white and uh, they're not interested in debate and discussion they're interested in people supporting um, and from that I mean it's come a whole long I mean I think that's been for the loss of both Israel and the Jewish people in other words I teach in what I consider to be an interesting class I'm skipping ahead of pre-Zionist visions pre-state visions and it's a class, and I do excerpts of from Jabotinsky, Aleph Dalit Gordon or Ben Gurion, and Magnus. And it provides an opportunity for people to understand that before the state, you weren't just a Zionist. There were different visions of what this state could be, should be, might be. And you had to grapple with it. And um, so I define Israel education as helping young and old develop their own views, even conflicting views about what Israel can, should might be, which strengthens commitment. That's the irony. So after 48, everybody rallies around the flag. All we're asked to do is clap, and we, there's tons to clap about. But therefore, no one develops their own views on what this place could be. And I define Israel education as dealing with the, the gray areas, the complicated areas, which we've systematically avoided. Um, most Americans, most of us are liberal nationalists. The Zionism that prevails is a conservative nationalism. It preferences a group. And therefore, when you're confronted with this, most people are intellect. I believe the community is intellectually naked. You know, people uh, say there's a problem with the college campus. Trust me, there's a, college there's a problem with the whole community. So that was the second uh, element that changes my life. Were you involved in Jewish life on campus? Was there Mono, Jewish life on campus? There was, minimally, I was involved in politics. Excuse me, I was involved in academics. First time for that, really. And loved it. Yeah. And stayed with it and loved it. And I was involved, so in 19... Uh, early, so I'm there, 64, 65, I take the lead in creating a political party that takes over student government called the Pitt Progressive Party. In the spring of 1965, March, the bridge is stopped in Selma. I mean, I'm involved in anti-war stuff. Bridge is stopped, and SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, puts a call out for Northerners to come down to Montgomery, Alabama, to, profess, to pressure Governor Wallace 
to allow the march to take place. I organize with a few others, and I'm the leader of 120 of us, three buses traveling to Montgomery, Alabama. And we spend eight days there. Eight days. And I was the leader of that. And uh, I mean, I could spend some like I spent time with Dr. King as the leader of the student group. I mean, John Lewis was there, right? I'll tell you a story with mean, John Lewis. Um, so we go there the first night, we go march to the Capitol. And um, that's the night that Lyndon Johnson gives the We Shall Overcome speech in Congress. We listen to it on the sidewalk. The next day we come back and a posse with bats and whips disperses us. I'm standing with John, I'm standing next to John Lewis. A posse of whom? Uh, Alabama police. Police. To disperse us. Bats and whips. And we come back into the African American, black area in the churches. And that night Dr. King comes and Andy Young comes and Abernathy. And to hear those preachers preach in those churches. I sometimes have said, I learned about tefillah, but I learned about inspiring tefillah. I mean, the, goth, the music, the singing, the preaching. What, I mean, what a privilege. So, um, so I was involved in that, anti-war, student government, um, academics. And I taught, studying my sophomore year, I taught Hebrew school. Um, and in a certain way, I had little to do with the Hillel. Now, the Hillel at the University of Pittsburgh was, I would not call it a great Hillel, but the Hillel director was Professor Richard Rubenstein, Rabbi Richard Rubenstein, Death of God, who, by the way, I invited to come with us on the trip to Alabama, and then later came back and got quite involved in criticizing the Civil Rights Movement for being anti-Jewish. So that's a whole other. Um, I found it. I, occasionally, I'd go on the high holidays if I was there, if I hadn't gone home. But I did not find it compelling at all. I found it blech. Uh, I taught Hebrew school and enjoyed it um, at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Um, Were you at Ramah during those summers? Uh, in 65, so you were staff 60, in Right. The, so 66, I get an award from the University of Pittsburgh, which is a scholarship to study at the University of Oslo Summer School, which is an international summer school. And I go. And it says it's, a, it's a, an award to study and um, travel. So I arrive in Scotland and hitchhike all through Europe and and then spent six weeks at the University of Oslo, which was quite interesting, with students from all over the world, Russians. This is 66, 60, whatever the year was, 66. <clears throat> I do organize a demonstration on July 4th against the war in Vietnam at the American Embassy. But, and actually, my closest little group, because, you know, it was like 500 students or 1,000, Close group was a Russian, a Yugoslav, and two other Americans, and we spent a lot of time together. And when I came back to Kennedy Airport, they stopped me and did an eight-hour. So I don't know. I can't imagine that American intelligence is that good, but they certainly were interested in that. Oh well, actually, one of the Americans, I told you three. One of the Americans actually the day before we left hope broke down that he was working for the national, the NSA. He'd been sent here to report on any Americans that were involved extensively with people from the, across the curtain, yeah. or did any politics. So did that lead, who knows, I mean, uh, yeah. so that was, what did I do, so that was 66, what did I do 67? 67 was right after the war. Ah, 67. The 67, the war happens. In Six day war. A dear friend of mine uh, invites me to go home with him from the University of Pittsburgh, now a professor at Columbia, and his home is in Uganda. And I go and I spend the summer in Uganda. In, he was an East Asian, so he was an Indian, so it was more of an Indian experience than it was an African experience. I was not an enthusiast for the 67 war. I to, on the one hand, I felt scared, like everyone else, and mobilized. I mean, excuse me, particularly afterwards. 
because I read so much about the efforts that had been underway diplomatically to defuse it. And later, was the preemptive war... Uh, I mean, I was both... I do remember being scared uh, at the early reports, but the truth is it was a quick victory. Um, You know, I mean, it's not, I wasn't. You're, so you're saying, when you're saying you weren't an enthusiast, was that? Well, I had already learned because about of this, these courses you've been taking. The you've courses, been, thinking, I, in other thinking and I, th yeah. then I realized occupation. So I was sort of relieved that Israel, which I had come to love, had been preserved and not as there had been threats that were going to drive into the sea. But on the other hand, I actually was skeptical of that because I knew that Israel's military military advantage was substantial even then. So, that, so I had these mixed feelings. Israel's military advantage was substantial even in 67, also even before that. And yet, you know, you could be afraid too, given what was being broadcast. So I'm saying I didn't buy on the whole thing, and then I saw the occupation, and now what was going to happen. And uh, Meanwhile, were you um, aware of feeling... Uh, uh, any sort of anti-Semitic strains within the New Left, anti-war movement, civil None. rights movement? No. Is that true? None? Hmm. Black, black Semitism? Yeah, a little Black Panther stuff about, you know, Jewish uh, landlords or whatever freaked me out a little bit. Uh -huh. um, but I basically, in part from where I came from, grew up, felt secure and... As an American. As an American and as a Jew. And always thought the anti-Semitic call-outs were a little exaggerated. Felt a little exaggerated, even then. Um, but I was sensitive to them, and I didn't like when I, when I heard... When I heard a Black Panther leader say things about any racial group, but particularly about Jews, I didn't like it whatsoever. But it wasn't driving you out of the movement. No, no. I was, uh, and by 67, 8, by 68, I was involved big time with state director for the students from McCarthy. Uh, and, but I was always a Kennedy. I mean, I loved John Kennedy. I adored. His assassination in 63, really heavy. I used to run home from school and listen to his press conferences. I thought he was the most elegant, humorous, smart, And, uh, and by the way, um, and we'll come to 68. So I was very involved. So I got involved in student politics. I mean, I was involved in 67. I did, oh, before I went to Uganda, I did Vietnam Summer. Vietnam Summer was knocking on the doors of people <clears throat> to try to both test and talk with them about the war in Vietnam. And I, you'd literally walk through streets. <clears throat> in Pittsburgh? In Pittsburgh, knocking on doors. Which was a fascinating experience. I mean, particularly in the Catholic areas, you'd see the picture of the Pope and John Kennedy. <clears throat> um, so I became involved with them. I mean, the war in Vietnam and civil rights were compelling and were engaging, and I was engaged in them. So while I was teaching Hebrew school, I, I mean, I think actually I said leaving my intense involvement with Jewish life in high school, I think I wanted to feel a little more comfortable in the school, university, get into academics a little more, and politics took over. Right. And yet, you emerged from college to go to rabbinical school. So I go in 1968, what am I going to do next? So I remember in the spring or whenever I, I prepare multiple applications. I apply to the Peace Corps, I apply to graduate school in Middle East politics, and I applied to rabbinical school at JTS. What had led you in that direction? At that <clears throat> because I think I wanted to be a clergyman. My issue, which will become an issue when I go to JTS, and I had a great year at JTS, but they wanted to make me a rabbi. And I wanted to, at that point, become a clergyman in the model of Heschel, Coffin, King. That I was still 
struggling with kind of universalism and particularism. And so I go to JTS in the Mechina program, which is a preparatory year, and I would say, on the one hand, I had great teachers, Professor Joel Roth in Talmud, Neil Gilman in theology, Cal Brand and who knows what uh, uh, thought, Ray Shenlin in uh, text in Chumash, or actually it was, we did Shmuel. Uh, brilliant. I mean, they were brilliant. And not only, and since the political I had come to, uh, they assigned me, at that point you worked off your scholarship by serving with a faculty member. And they assigned me to Professor Heschel. So I spent a year as Professor Heschel's assistant at JTS. What was, so, your, what was your image of Heschel when you came into JTS? Your image? I, mean, he'd been I knew little about him. I knew little about him. The iconic photo of him walking arm in arm with well, Martin Luther King. Right. I know that. Um, You just said he was, that was, he was one of, the, he was the Jewish person you mentioned in this pantheon of Oh, yes. Well, that's, so I knew enough about him, right. Um, you knew that. You knew right. that he was involved. So in these were people involved in social justice, mm -hmm. involved in trying to deal with the ills of the world, and yet deeply rooted in religious tradition. And that was connecting different pieces of mine that felt real, real at that point. Um, so I always joked, which is not unrelated to the creation of the Chavra. In other words, I went there and I wanted to study, talk about life and death and meaning, and they wanted me to study Chumash and Rashi. At JTS. I wanted to study, study, think about the purpose of life and what's the meaning of life and how to, how to discern meaning. And they said, you got to first learn. You just mentioned the, the tensions that you were struggling with between universalism and particularism. You were in rabbinical school, or heading into rabbinical school. I was in rabbinical school. You were in rabbinical school, which is a very particular path, shall we say. How were you, what was, what was the, how was that struggle manifested for you at that point? Well, I think in, in what I wanted to focus on. I wanted to focus on the bigger issues of life and meaning, and they wanted me to focus on text. And I, retrospectively, I appreciate, and it was later, when I studied weekly, particularly with a chaver, Richie Siegel, that I, for the first time, really had powerful textual experience and, and, and learned the joy and the, of studying text and the way that can connect you to God. I hadn't had that experience. And add that to feeling probably insecure Hebraically, particularly in that context. And the whole thing was kind of intimidating, you know, like they're going to call on you. And, you know, I mean, when I got an honorary degree at JTS, I told the story of what it was at that point to get on an elevator at JTS. And they were small elevators, and on would come Ginsburg or Professor Finkelstein or Lieberman. And you just, you know, when would the door open? <laughs> Um, so, I didn't feel much community there. I mean, in southern churches you felt community, and in political groups, including the, the, the McCarthy and Kennedy, you felt community. Israel trip, you felt community. I didn't feel much community there. I wasn't really studying the broad issues that I wanted to be thinking about. Um, and I was probably still struggling with the universalism, particularism, which, by the way, let me skip forward. So I mentioned the two things that have changed my life or shaped my life. Maybe there are only three, <laughs> Jewishly. One was Ramah. One was taking a course in Middle East politics. The third, late that spring, I'm already leaving JTS. I'm going probably late winter. And I'm in Europe with my parents. You're talking about um, 69, 69. 69, early 69. And I'm in, in, in Europe with my parents, and actually, I'm skiing with my parents in Europe, and I'm in northern Italy. And on the way back, we're going, we had flown to Munich. And my father now, or mother, says we should stop and go, and go to Dachau. And we go to Dachau, and I can still vividly recall standing in front of those ovens, 
the shovel next to it, shovels next to it, and looking in them and saying, even though I might believe that in the end of the day we are all one and we're all to be human beings, I would have been in those ovens. And I accept being a Jew right there as a point of departure. It resolves my universalism, particularism issue from right there. And then the issue is, what do I want to do with my Jewish life? So first of all, during the year at the seminary, which I want to say again, they treated me great, they were wonderful. Um, I'm actually remembering a very funny story. It doesn't matter. We don't need this. It's not related to the Chavara. But the, I read three important books that I still recall beyond the studying of text, which I was introduced to. Number one, I read Kaplan. And since I was having theological doubts, Kaplan was very important for me and in many ways really helped me uh, understand that I could connect Kedusha with something other than a supernatural God above. Okay. So that Second, I read, I started out, I read both the introduction and dabbled in the introduction to the Zionist idea and dabbled in it. And that was really important for me also to understand the multiple, more about Zionism, etc. And third, I read Heschel. Loved the Sabbath, loved prophets. Um, Did you develop a personal relationship with him? We always were had a warm relationship. Um, I mean, my memory of it, this is 1968, 69. Now, he dies in 71 or 72. Um, so, I mean, he had me several times to his home for Shabbat, so I met Susanna there. Um, and his wife, who I knew and connected with in a different setting later, the 92nd Street Y. Um, well, first of all, one of my, you're the secretary for him. So you literally came once or twice a week. He'd occasionally call. So first of all, I remember coming in. It's, a, it's an office, I mean, maybe even smaller than this, packed with books. Packed. <coughs> and he'd be there. And often with my memory, of, I'd walk in and he'd have his cigar with his ash. And I'd be petrified. The ash would fall on the beard and he'd be, um, you know. Citerate. Um, the second is um, his attention to language, because he'd have he'd dictate letters. But I mean, the letters were going to like the Pope, and if they weren't going to the Pope, they were going to somebody the number two in the Vatican. You know, his attention and his first of all, his brilliant use of English. This is not his native language, and his attention to language, and he. It was really, like, amazing. He was kind. When I told him I was leaving the seminary, I was really sorry. He, was, he encouraged me to give it another year. Um, at different times, for example, we had we organized a sanctuary for a draft resistor at the seminary in the, in the um, main place where services were already, I arranged for him to come down to it, which was a big thing for the event, speak at it. Um, I don't want to overstate or understate. I mean, he by then, by 68, 69, he, as you said, he was uh, Heschel, uh, even more so after his death, I want to say. Remember, he was isolated at the seminary, very isolated at the seminary, and um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, he was not a Talmudist. That was not, he was into being out there and, uh, in the world. Did you continue to see him involved in, in, in these larger struggles? Did I continue to see him? Involved in these larger struggles that had... Sure, had and place. that's part of what you did as a secretary, was the interaction with those folk and scheduling and correspondence. And, you know, there was no email or anything, so it was a privilege, total privilege. I mean, um, I mean to have had the opportunity to work if briefly with Dr. King and Professor Heschel, you know. Which brings us to 1969. So 1969, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> 1969, so I then decide I'm leaving the seminary and apply or reapply to Columbia 
maybe I had applied to Columbia, had been accepted, so reactivate my application, and actually go that summer to the University of Pennsylvania, where I study Arabic for the first time, because I'm going to a, uh, a, uh, a PhD program in, in Middle East politics. I want to concentrate in political science in the Middle East, and Penn has a, a very fine Arabic department. Um, but by then, by the spring of 69, is when w the efforts are made to begin to create what is the New York Havra. Is that right? Yes. So uh, tell us about how and uh, when the ideas for this new community began to take shape. Right. And, and what the motivations were for the people who were involved. You know, um, when um, when uh, I'm, uh, when um, I remember, I recently I had a conversation with Rabbi Wolf Kelman, a very distinguished rabbi, then the head of the rabbinical assembly. He said, "When people take new jobs, there's always a push and a pull." I remember this. Was, so there was obviously something among the, a group of people that was not comfortable at the seminary, the seminary at that point. And that group at the beginning included my old friend Peter Geffen. I would say Rabbi Eugene Wiener, who was working at the seminary as the head of the Finkelstein Institute, quite close to, it's now the Finkelstein Institute. It wasn't called that then. Um, it was the Lehman Institute for Ethics, right? Is that right? Maybe. It had a couple of different names, actually. Okay. So he was very involved in it. Uh, I mean, we had become friends during my year at the seminary, actually in Sukkot. We went up, he had a place in northern Massachusetts. We went up there for Sukkot. You and Rabbi Wiener. With his family. Mm -hmm. Actually, Hillel, Hillel Levine was up there. Steve Shaw was up there that weekend. Peter had already been a friend of uh, Gene's. I had met Gene at Camp Ramah in 1961 and had actually encouraged me to go to the seminary. When I was thinking about it, we had dinner and he had encouraged me to come to the seminary. I was actually, well, that's another cute story. When I was decided to go to rabbinical school, <clears throat> I actually contemplated going to HUC. And when I got my honorary degree at HUC, I told the story, how I went to the admissions department there, uh, admissions, and when I, because I thought, I, I thought in many ways I'm a non-halachic person. I thought maybe I'd do better at HUC when I told them, I said, you don't belong here. You belong up at JTS. Why? Why did they think that? Then I'm told now by people in the reform movement that that was a more insular place. They wanted people who were more movement-oriented, comfortable in the movement, and I clearly seem to be a conservative, not about their movement. You never know what would have happened in all these things. Um, so first of all, from this year, Chavarat Shalom, had been created in the fall of 68. Yes. So word of it was all over. And what was, that was about smaller community and studying in different kinds of ways. Did you personally know Art Green from? No. Okay. In fact, I didn't know anybody there, I don't think. But people there did. Alan Mintz right. uh, knew Art Green, for instance. But Alan wasn't at JTS then. Alan was, a gradu Alan was an undergraduate at Columbia. Um, I mean, I think Gene Wiener did. People did. But we knew of it. I mean, I'm just giving my own participation. Right. Um, so there's a small group. So I'm thinking about who are the people. Now, we had done some things together, including organizing the sanctuary for a draft resistor. So who, that, was the, who was the draft resistor? Burton Weiss, who ends up being a member of the New York Havara, now in Berkeley, I believe. I don't... Um, so we, that's when we first met Burton Weiss. Um, and I understand that you used to meet regularly in, in Eugene Wiener's apartment. I don't, regularly, I think, is a little overstated. But we did have, so Gene was involved in this in an important way that we should, and why he was uncomfortable. I mean, he was very close to the chancellor, Louis Finkelstein. What this was about for him, I know not. Um, and he ultimately ends up making Aliyah. 
so he checks out. But there was some part of him, and by the way, Gene, who I stayed related to, actually it was his funeral in Israel several years back, there was a change element of him, and he was a tumbler. He was involved in creating the Abraham Fund and other things. Um, so I do remember a very one or two evenings at his home, one a very important one. So we were trying to contemplate what it would be to create a small, intentional community seminary. And those words, community, were part of it. One that also had a deep commitment to social engagement, if not social justice. Because all of us that had been involved in, and it, it led to the question of what we'd even want to study. Uh, there was a wonderful evening at his home, maybe you've, with Jack Neusner. Did you hear about this? Um, so Gene had been very close to Professor Jacob Neusner. And where was Neusner at that point? I believe he was at Brown. And we had an evening with him. And he gave the following, and this is now, so since I'm 31, 41, almost 50 years later, in which Neusner is, um, he, said, he gave a lecture which was called Torah Myth. Who was, excuse me? Torah Myth. Torah Myth. And he said, the problem with all of the seminaries is as follows. You are a young seminarian. You want to study and probe life and meaning and purpose. They said, no, no, you can't do that. You've got to study text first. So you study Chumash and Rashi and Talmud. You study, you become a rabbi, and then you, they say to you, okay, you now say, now I want to study Torah, life and meaning and purpose and death. It says, no, 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 no. You have to get a PhD in Talmud to do that. So you spend another five years, you, become a, you have a PhD in Talmud, you learn this, you get your PhD in Talmud. They say, now I want to study life, meaning, purpose, Torah, etc. No, 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 you have to become Lieberman. You never become Lieberman. Lieberman, the great Talmud professor then. He said, I reverse it. What are the issues that are leading you to want to become a rabbi? What is it that you, that you need to study with life or meaning or death? Or the, and let you, that drive you. Learn the texts and the skills that are needed to understand the issue that's driving you there, not assuming you're going to master this whole sea, which you will never na- master. And it was very, po- I'm, st- I'm telling you this 47 years later, so um, it was a very powerful evening. Led to us to think about what we want to study. Now, I was already going off. You see, there were people in this group that wanted to go to, this, to the Chavura as a form of rabbinical school and become rabbis. Others of us were more involved. We would create, I, create a community which would be intimate, personal, um, intimate, personal, intentional community. And we talked about communal meals. We talked about study. We talked about Shabbat retreats. This was all in the spring. The question I'm coming to is, who is that? We'll come, and then the question: There'd be classes, but the classes would not be textually from the text. It would be from the issue. From Newsner affected that discussion. Um, who was the group? Mm-hmm. I think the most initial, the initial group, and I can't tell you who the connectors were of this. Who pulled the people in? The group in the initial group, and I was searching this morning at home to see if I had the original brochure. Do you have the brochure? I don't have it, but I, I've, I've read pieces of it. And I have Do you have the things. names? Uh, what, the names I have are um, you, Ruvain Kimmelman. Who oh, was then a, an advanced rabbinical school student. Uh, Peter Geffen and Alan Mintz. Those are the four names. And Gene Wiener. And Gene Wiener. Um... So are you saying there were it was a broader group than that? Not much, that, that group. And then we went to go and reach out to people. But was it, uh, I'm still trying to understand, was it originally conceived, as Chavarat Shalom was in that first year or two, as a seminary, as an alternative seminary? But yes, no. I mean, yes, it was on the table. We applied for whatever you needed to do to be able to, to be give, chartered to be seminary. chartered and to give the degrees which we were granted. Um, and how much of that had to do with wanting to uh, be a way for people to get a 4F? Well, I think for one or two people, that mattered a lot. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but it wasn't the primary driver. I think the primary d driver was. Well, you know, I mean, I'm t your question is leading me to be reflective myself, which is, I suppose, what a good interview does about this thing. I was still drawn to Jewish life, leaving the seminary, and wanted a Jewish community of seriousness, so intimate, so an int a small, intimate one that would be deeply engaged with social issues of, in varying ways, spoke to me. So pulled together the sort of the key elements um, that you were looking for in life: community, learning, study, as you said, prayer, prayer, and and friendship, and, friendship, and, which and is activism, Your and activism, and activism, come through and this engagement. With each right, other. and we envisioned, and actually, the first year and two or three, mm -hmm. you know, going to doing social engagement, going to anti-war demonstrations together, making Shabbos together as part of that, that would be a, a, a component. It would feel to be integrating. All part of the vision. It would feel to be integrating. Um, and there were other ideas that were. What, what about the notion of um, like what, place where? How important was Well, I, I trust you know that, and excuse me, I shouldn't trust you know. Um, so we spent a lot of time on place. One of Gene Wiener's closest friends also was Everett Gendler. Uh, that's the connection to Everett. Everett was spending that year in Guernavaca. Mexico. Mexico. Gene, Peter, and I somehow pooled money and gave him a plane ticket to come up to try to uh, recruit him to be a key member. And we found an estate in the upstate. I have no idea. We traveled up there, and we were going to buy this estate, um, which would be a place where it would be located. Where people would actually live, or it would, would be a retreat place? People would live, and, excuse me, and or a retreat place. We also searched in New York. And retrospectively, we could. I remember looking at the slums on 85th, well, then slums, 85th Street, 84th Street, between Amsterdam and Columbus, right across from the Brandeis School, which they were dumps then. This is 1970. You could buy them for like 50 grand. Uh, you know, they're probably worth 5 million today or 10 million, but holding that aside. <clears throat> and during this year, by the way, a few of us went off and did some fundraising for this. Who'd you fundraise with? Somehow I remember going to Rabbi Martin Siegel. You know the name? Mm -hmm. So Martin Siegel is a rabbi who my parents were a little bit involved with, down in the five towns, who, who ultimately put out a book, or excuse me, had a huge article in New York Magazine called Diary of a Rabbi, which became its own scandal. But he was well connected, and I think from a wealthy family himself. We did a fundraiser in Cleveland at Park Synagogue or something, where people, there was um, kind of support from people who knew that the large suburban synagogue, that they wanted more participation, participation, more intimacy, more intensity, and so it sort of had resonance. What, what would have been in it for, for these funders? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think retrospectively, it was a period of time when, in a certain way, when they saw young Jews doing anything, they were so excited, they, they were so positive, and others, they still care enough to there go was at anxiety it. anxiety that people were right. assimilating. Right. So that I don't know if it was, was anxiety, I don't know. I mean, it's a, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was anxiety that people were assimilating, or they didn't feel, to, to see young Jews in the 1970s actively trying to create Jewish life, there were a lot of people that responded to that very positively. Did you actually raise money? Some, I don't, uh, but I wouldn't overstate it. But and not, not enough to? Not enough to raise, not enough at all, so that ultimately we don't buy a building on 84th Street. Everett decides to go to, to Boston, <clears throat> and he and Mary buy a place outside, and he becomes a figure at Chavarat Shalom, and we rent an apartment at 98th, 80, 89th, I believe. 98th, 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 98th and Broadway, yeah. and everybody pools money. And to pay the rent. To pay the rent and whatever else we needed. I mean, that was a whole thing also differentiates us from present generations, which expend funders to pay this. And somehow, and it's just a question of how, um, we all 
figured this was our responsibility to figure out how to cover it. We didn't ask anybody else. We paid the cost going up, going forward. And then at a certain point, we went to <clears throat> we went to include others, and so there was an interviewing process. Yes, definitely. I, I have one other question before we get to that, which was in the consideration of whether or not this would be an alternative seminary. Um, I'd like to understand how you how you were thinking about positioning this um, in relationship to JTS and HUC, because a number of the people you were who were potentially going to be involved were actually students at one or the other of these. They were rabbinical students. So it was the idea that they would leave JTS, this would become their rabbinical school, or that it was somehow supplementary? I think it was mostly meant, I'm, I don't recall, I mean, I was leaving, Peter was not in JTS. Um, nor was Alan Mintz. Nor was Alan Mintz. Nor was Alan. I mean, I think we were positioning it as an alternative seminary community, but, and we put out the first call was sort of an app, a request, or not request, but a sort of here we are, and if you're interested in pursuing this, I think the number of people who were interested in pursuing seminary through New York Havara were very, very few. Um, and one or two of them, you might say, were there, I mean, I don't know this 100%, might have been there for the, for the, for the deferment. Um, I don't think it ever became... I mean, in candor, between the announcement, which if you ask me when, I would say March or April of 69, and its first year, which was the fall of 69, I think simply the process of who was there led the, se the seminary piece to become notwithstanding. Sort of and it was now an alternative Jewish community of intensity, uh, or a desire to be intense. So you, you were mentioning just a minute ago that you produced a brochure. Um, so who developed the language for the brochure and who was your target audience, so to speak, for this brochure? Where was it going to be distributed? I mean, I vaguely recall, you know, this is be interesting and uh, I think I was involved in drafting. I think Gene Wiener was involved in drafting. And then it was circulated around, and Peter had some comments, and Ruben Kimmelman, and maybe Alan Mintz. And we sent it out to the Jewish media. That means the Jewish Week and uh, whoever else. In New York. In New York. Well, the Jewish Post and Opinion, I think we thought was a national. We sent it out to um, Hillel Rabbis. Uh, so we were still Lo locally, or, or I think nationally. Nationally, I think we sent it out to rabbis. I think we got the name of the somehow we got the names of the RA, and the uh, Reform Rabbinate. So we um, and maybe Jewish Studies. Now, Jewish Studies was not what it is now, but there were some Jewish. It was emerging. I think that's who we sent it to. And how many people were you envisioning as being part of this? Intentional I think the first year we hoped for 20 or 30, max, max 30. So here's some of the language from the original brochure. Um, this is the introductory language. Free from ties with other institutions, the Havara will aim to create a new kind of religious leadership for the Jewish community and to serve as a model for a new form of Jewish life. Can you elaborate on what... A little overstated. Uh, a little... Uh, <laughs> What was motivating this desire for a new form of leadership and, and for that matter, uh, the vision for a new form of Jewish life? I mean, what comes to mind, this is now 45 years later. What comes to mind is, number one, the distance between the intensity of Jewish life, which most of us had enjoyed, whether it be a camp or Israel trips or whatever, and most of Jewish life that we experienced in synagogues and Hillel's, et cetera, number one. And number two, 
the extent to which re religious leadership um, well I would say number, number two um, it's interesting to the distance also of the, so much of the Jewish community from deep engagement in the social issues of our day um, and third I w would say the kind of performance that had become routine in so many of our large institutions. The performative aspect of there, being so, a rabbi. And a cantor and the davening and we so that was part of actually the distance from Ramah in a sense. We had learned, all of us had experienced participatory Jewish life and which felt to be with soul and heart and yet so much of the institutional Jewish life felt to be performance assimilative in acculturating by design passive for the context. passive and so I think that's what we meant we were adding as opposed the engagement with uh, in social issues which joined us yeah. um, right so you so you were going to send this out and there was a process how did how did well, in the meantime, I remember Gene was very important. We should reach out and identify people. And so we all started talking about people that we knew um, that, you know, to who knew what, at uh, Columbia, JTS, at, around, and people started identifying names. And a, a process, a pretty haphazard process, uh, particularly the first year, was developed to meet with, interview, and somehow, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember if I did any of the interviewing. And um, my recollection is no. Not just because I was busy and doing other things. I was, uh, so I don't know who did. Right. So this, this became actually, you know, a point uh, this interview process, this application process, became an, an area that, during through which uh, people leveled criticisms, actually, of the Havra, uh, that it was elitist in its in its uh, conception and in how it went about uh, getting members. Um, do you recall discussions about that? That and who would be that in and of itself, um, and also what were in fact, were there in fact, criteria for selection, um, and, and what was the process that people went through to become members? I'm, I'm pausing because I'm genuinely uncertain. I mean, I do remember, and the interviewing was years later kind of joked about, but it didn't feel good at the time to people. And there were a few people, names escaped me, that people were not welcomed into the, I mean, in other words, retrospectively, I think it's fair to say that the New York Havara simply did not develop with the self-awareness, consciousness, intensity that Havara Shalom did. In other words, at the, it had some of the aspiration for the, I'm now not talking, for that, but it just, it became more of, well, excuse me, may I may be romanticizing Chavarat Shalom. Chavarat Shalom had the same critiques around elitism in terms of who was admitted and who wasn't. People were rejected. There was always a question of fit. This was the elitism in the sense of looking for people with a certain kind of background, perhaps, level of knowledge, perhaps, and fit just in terms of... Interpersonal. Interpersonal. Who you wanted to be hanging out with in this intensive... But then it became, you know, to which some would say, was it really a social club? Which, yes, had Shabbat retreats and study, etc. But was it a kind of selective minion as opposed to, it was more than a minion because the retreats, as a, no doubt you've heard, we will discuss, were very intense. Yeah, we'll get to um, that. But there was a social club quality, and I'm trying to think about who was not accepted and why. And I, do you, do you have any name? 
Yes, but not that I want to say on camera. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I do remember that there was one instance, which I also won't use the name, of someone who had gone out with a, a woman and there was the question of whether everybody would be comfortable. They had broken up and they decided they could be and they were. Um, Do you remember, I mean, was there a particular kind of person that uh, you were looking for in sort of filling out this group in terms of background? I mean, I think interest? retrospectively, I think we were looking for people who had a serious desire to build Jewish community and could bring, whether it be knowledge, learning, whether it be experience in community organizing, whether it be experience in Jewish community building, as we'd say. I think that's what we were looking for. Um, someone who had no interest in this and no experience in this was, we weren't looking for them to become a member, although later, if we had high holiday services, Shabbat, they, they're welcome to come. So somehow we thought membership um, but I, uh, my recollection on the membership is pretty weak. How about in terms of sort of the political orientations of people who are likely to become involved? Who, who, how would you describe the group in that? Well, way? you know, in, the, in 1968, 69, 70, as opposed to today, the community had more or less shared, broad shared views, anti-war, civil rights, pro-Israel, um, the huge bifurcation of Jewish life about what it means to be pro-Israel had not taken place yet. I mean, that's, you know, in a certain kind of way, the Mort Klein and J Street are fighting about what it means to be pro-Israel today. They both believe they're pro-Israel, if not, if not others. That was not the case then. So I think so, but you are correct. It may have been I would say something really which doesn't feel great, but there was some sense of seriousness that people needed to be serious. You know, my dear friend Alan Mintz is a serious person. Did a Ruven Kimmelman with a great sense of humor. Uh, uh, serious. And so um, I'm using that as two examples, and I could cite others as well. So seriousness, I think, was seriousness and assets they would be bringing, I don't mean money, but knowledge, experience in building community. Uh. One thing we haven't mentioned at all is uh, the policy towards uh, admission of women. Well, we knew there, was a, there weren't a lot of women at the outset. The list you um, there were we mentioned, there were none. So I think early on, uh, there was a conscious effort to say, could we identify some women right in the outset? And I believe we were able to recruit, uh, entice. Um, I think Liz Colton became a member at that point. I think Phyllis and David Sperling became members at that point. I, uh, David had been at a seminary, I don't know where he was teaching, may have been teaching at HUC by then or JTS. Um, I think Shira, then Shira Sugarman and Alan Sugarman, they became members at that time in the first year. Uh, so I think there was a conscious effort. To reach out to women. To get, or couples that. Or couples where, where, and, where right. which would bring women as well. Right. Which was in contrast to Club Shalom, which for the first several years did not admit women. Women were only there um, as girlfriends or in a few cases as wives. Um, but it was a seminary. And this was what Art Green describes as a pre-feminist moment. The first uh, ordination of a woman was several years away, right. in 1972, Sally Presand, and the reform movement. Um, so this is a contrast if, the, if New York Cover Art was actually recruiting women right from the beginning, in 69. There, there, there was a, I don't want to overstate, there was a conscious, I think it was a conscious effort um, conscious effort. I don't want to overstate it. I don't think it was the most important thing going on. We were trying to get a great group together. 
a right. group that create could create community, and people would bring interesting things both in the learning and the davening, etc. Some people have pointed to um, a uh, an, an experience, a, a joint experience of going to the mobilization for peace in November 1969, right after the New York Havara was founded, as a real uh, opportunity. Very powerful. Can you describe what that was like in, <coughs> for the for, for the Havara as an experience? Well, I think it was integrative. I think there was a desire there to end the diffuse nature of life, that the notion of integration, of having your religious community, your davening community, and the one that you shared core, not uniform, but core uh, social, political instincts, felt powerful and desirable. And therefore, going to, going to the mobilization, but so making worried about what that was too. The mobilization was one of, you know, there must have been eight or ten times we went to Washington to protest the war in Vietnam, starting in nineteen sixty five, my first. And, and this was a very large one. This was one of the largest. Uh, I can't remember anymore what the the immediate event that led to this one, but it may have been an escalation of bombing, it may have been I, I don't know. But it was going to be a very large one. We had a deep desire to go. And we were able to make arrangements so we could have Shabbos dinner and Shabbos davening and stay close enough to walk together to the march. And that felt like, wow, that's what we're about here. Trying so to did you go down in cars or on buses? Or I think people went down in cars, but separately. Mm -hmm. But you hitched a ride with different people. And, uh, and stayed together. And we stayed to together in sleeping bags on the floor and uh, made sh had Shabbat. I mean, I still can visually remember... Not a particularly elegant, but Shabbos dinner, Shabbos davening on Friday night. Where was that? Where did that take place? I it was just, your question prompted the memory. Was it Serrata's apartment? or uh, No, it was Serrata's sister's apartment, I believe. Uh, Jerry what, Serrata. What, Jerry Serrata's sister's. Is that, does, I think that might be right. Um, and she was living in Washington. And, and it was near enough. To and it was a large life. floor, and it was close enough. It was around DuPont Circle. And so you had to get down to the mall. Uh, for the demonstration, and but I think what it reflected was the desire for people like ourselves who had had serious Jewish journeys and interest in Jewish community, not to do politics with others, but to be able to do it together. As Jews. As Jews. Yeah. And I think that was a very powerful. Um, birthing, early birthing, solidify. I mean, you know, you spend, you do that, the traveling, the making Shabbos dinner, everybody bringing different things for Shabbos dinner, who's bringing the Sidurim, who's, the, you know, I mean, the whole thing is a, you know, you're sort of a tent community, and then we come back and we do Havdalah in the apartment. And if my recollection, it was a cold day. And uh, uh, it was a cold November day. It didn't have to be cold, but it was. Um, Did it, would you say, approach the feeling of sort of kedusha that you had experienced no. earlier? No. I mean, I think on ret many retreats, I mean, retreats were a <coughs> very important element of the New York Havara. And many Friday night davening, Shabbos morning holidays, we went away for Sukkot and for Shavuot. I did feel that sense of specialness, sacredness, etc. This was too much of a balagan. I mean, you know, we were all piled into places. There wasn't enough room. Everybody had their sukkah. It, it, was, it was balagan, but we were glad to be there because it was Shabbos and protesting the war. Mm. Um, would you say that uh, participating in this mobilization as a Havara had an impact on uh, Sort of the directions the Havara took in terms of political activism, or just the the, the, the sense of purpose. I think it was a confirming event. Confirming for that's why we created this thing, to be able to do this. Truth, I don't think there were that many more events of that kind. We did some, 
of that kind where everybody, my recollection, everybody was there. It was still new. It was the first time. Uh, I can't, I need a history of the anti-war movement to tell you where we were in that process. But it was very confirming. That's why we did this. And, you know, others, including Chavar, they wouldn't have done this. We did this. And it's about who we were. Actually, there were people from, uh, the Chavarot Shalom members were there as well. With us? I, I don't know if they were in the apartment with you, but they were there as a group. Um, cool. Yeah. Also. I stand corrected. I think this might be a good time for a break. How's okay. that sound? Okay. Rolling. We were discussing before we took a break for lunch um, some of the things that helped build community in the Chavarot. And I want to look at some of the key areas of Havarua life and go back to the issue of community a little bit more. So some observers have commented that compared to Havarat Shalom and Fabrengen, the New York Havara found its greatest strength as a social and intellectual community rather than as a prayer community or even a social action community. Um, first place, would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, uh, yes, but I would say the intellectual was awful ab often about social engagement. So many of the issues we studied, discussed, communal meals, retreats, were actually related to broader social issues. Um, I think action, like the mobilization, became less frequent, but... Um, We'd have speakers that would come on occasion if they met our approval. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and many of the heated discussions and non-heated discussions were about social policy, uh, the war, civil rights, our Israeli-Palestinian relations, mm -hmm. etc. So, But that said, I think there's an element of that. I mean, I think um, with one one more addition, social. I mean, the social, though, was arranged around Shabbat, Sukkot, Shavuot. It was the most intense communal moments, periods, were the monthly Shabbat retreats. That's very intense. I mean, just the organization. Where we're, and so each, at each retreat, there would need to be a coordinator. That requires location, transportation, food, tefillah, discussion. And each of those had people. So it was about creating a Shabbos community of which tefillah was an element. So I don't think tefillah as standalone, but the building the community. Ditto on Shavuot, the tikkun, but always the davening, the food. All of this was about making, providing an opportunity for religious moments for extended religious moments, which included tefillah. So I don't think tefillah was a standalone, but I think it was deeply embedded. Religious, it was, you see, when I think of social, I think of going out on a Saturday night with friends. That was not this. My social life was not with the Chavarah. I was single. I'd have my friends. In other words, religious community creating a monthly Shabbos retreat is a, is a, you know, it wasn't every month during the summer, but, uh, but it was seven, eight a year, maybe nine. And on Sukkot, and on Shavuot. Anyway, I've made my point. Yeah. In fact, the, the Chavara did gather on a regular basis. You had weekly... Um, Shabbos dinners. Commun uh, communal, uh, communal dinners. Thursday nights. From right, Thursday. right. Thursday evening, communal meals followed by, as you said, either a meeting a meeting to discuss something or a program. Right. So the New York Hover has also been described as the one with the really good food. Um, so that food, food and cre that creating of the sort of community around food and discussion were, were really important as well. And where, where would these um, communal meals take place? At the, the communal meals, the weekly communal meals yeah. would take place at the apartment on 98th Street. And was it the same kind of thing, that someone was in charge? Yes, 
someone was in charge. Um, would people bring food? Was it like potluck or someone would make food? I'm trying to think that myself. Yeah. I, um, there was good food at the Chavura, but I don't remember the food being as central as that. In other words, it was mm -hmm. okay, but uh, there were some good cooks. I mean, some, some members were serious cooks, and they took it very seriously. Others of us brought the drinks. <laughs> Right. Paper goods, the <laughs> setup, the cleanup, um, uh, but they took place, and it was a serious here too. I mean, this was everybody, not everybody. This was a serious amount of energy. There was to plan each week a communal meal, first the meal, and the um, and the program, and if there was a meeting, that was the meeting was on a business matter. You know, right. like whatever the business matter was. Well, what, can you describe sort of the aesthetic of the of the apartment and and the what this meal was like? Um, well, the the apartment had uh, a living room and two bedrooms, one on each side, and a kitchen, and a sort of large foyer where you'd come into. So, generally speaking, the living room was the area where we gathered for the eating and or um, meeting or whatever. And the davening, when we had Shabbos, when we had services, would extend into the foyer. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, at different times, people lived in the bedrooms. Both bedrooms or one or just well, one? Well, definitely one. I'm try I was trying to think that myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, so, number one, someone often living there, but that other one, which might be empty, so if you had some important conversation, you sometimes go into the other room to have the serious one-on-one -on -one while the group was eating or social socializing uh, or gathering. Uh, that also allowed two classes at a time. So there were times you'd have two classes going on before a communal meal on another night. In other words, particularly the first two years, there were incredible teachers teaching at the place. I don't know. We'll this come to that. Yep. Um, and uh, so there could be two at a time. Right. Or there could be a class and people preparing the communal meal. Or there could be a class and a meeting. So there's a lot of activity going on. There was considerable activity, I mean, on, on retrospectively, on for a volunteeristic community of which almost everybody was doing a lot of other things. People were graduate school students, some people had jobs, some people were teaching. So this was a lot of energy for people. There were no kids yet. Which was significant. Significant. So, um, um, as we just said, in addition to the meal, there was often um, either a meeting or a program. I want to talk about the meetings for a minute. Um, would you say there were major um, issues or topics that came up for discussion? How? What were the kinds of issues that the Chavara was at the facing? meeting? At the meetings. First of all, there was always, it wasn't a big time consumer, but the financial issue. There were, at times, membership issues. Mm -hmm. Some people are moving to New York, they want to become members. Some people are leaving, whatever. Um, three, um, what's well, coming up, this is a lot of years back, like we, need, we want to buy Cedarim, which Cedor? Right. Um, four, which I'm somewhat embarrassed about, is um, because, for example, we had, I do recall Nachum Goldman speaking to us. Can you say who he is? Nachum Goldman, Dr. Nachum Goldman, Rabbi Nachum Goldman, was the head president of the World Jewish Congress. But during the 40s and 50s and 60s, one of the premier global Jewish leaders outside of the state of Israel, I mean, after 48. He was an, also a major dove and a very cultured guy and um, very interesting. Um, so we had him speak to us. We had a debate about whether Mordechai Kaplan should be invited to speak. And if my recollection is correct, we decided no, because he was too denominational, which strikes me as crazy. But, um, and I think that was a kind of fierce discussion 
Um, there may have been a lot of elements around that because we had people tied to the seminary, etc. Kaplan, of course, at this point was still tied to the seminary. So I vague, my vague recollection is we did not, after an extended conversation, um, have uh, Dr. Kaplan come to speak uh, to, the, to the group. Would there, would there often be debates about whether a particular individual was someone you wanted to invite to speak to the group? Not often, but uh, we didn't have that many outside speakers. Okay. But I do recall that one. Um, I, the, meetings were not, the meetings were more taken care of. The retreat, we have a problem into we can't get the place. How do people feel about this place? It's three hours away as opposed to an hour and a half. Also, the logistics relating to the communal meals. How about logistics relating to... Just, were there um, logistics relating not only to just how many hours, but what the import of that was relative to, let's say, what time um, Shabbos started, or those kinds of issues. Yeah, yeah. And there were and, and there were issues and there were issues related to food having get to get there by Shabbos. So, in other words, there are people that would not travel on Shabbat. There were people that traveled more loosely or did. Mm -hmm. But if everybody's there were people that would not eat food unless it had arrived by Shabbat. So that was always an issue. That was an issue. That was that was people who were aware of, and we had to accommodate. And that might have been a factor in. Uh, thinking about three, you know, a three-hour trip, particularly during the winter. And I got Shabbat started earlier, right? Yeah. So these kinds of things would get discussed and hashed at the out meetings. And decided I would, in the meetings. My memory is more that the meetings were about a range of logistics relating to could be prayer. And as if we were having different times, we had high holiday tefillot, mm -hmm. um, Shabbos. Sometimes, I mean, the first year, I believe we had Shabbos services. Every uh, every other Shabbos if, during the day, Shabbos morning. Shabbos morning. So. Um, uh, that drifted off when it wasn't as viable. But that was so. There were a lot of logistic arrangements. There was no staff. There was no so everybody. This was entirely voluntary. So whether it was tefillot, Shabbos dinners, communal meals, Shabbos retreats, all of that, the money. That's what the, the meetings were about, and most people we didn't. Most of us didn't have that much tolerance for it. And membership issues. And membership issues, inclusion, exclusion. Yeah. Um, in the other chavarot, of the, well, at that this point it was only chavarot shalom. These meetings were often very fraught right. and emotional. Would that happen here too? On occasion, my memory is on occasion. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not. But I, my imagination is the the meetings at chavarot shalom were more about ideology and substance, uh, kind of Jewish substance in whatever way. How are we going to do this? Should we do this? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Were there th things that were just uh, sort of taken for granted here, like Kashrus? Kashrus was taken for granted. But, but level uh, of Kashrut, for yeah, instance. Yeah, the level of Kashrus. I mean, um, I'm trying to think whether I mean, obviously, it was people did bring food cooked at the homes, mm -hmm. um, and it, it, that included meat, i.e., chicken. Right, but I would cetera. assume it wasn't only, vegetarian. It was not vegetarian. I would assume only that food from kosher. I mean, only food cooked from kosher homes, but no one checked. Uh, to my knowledge, there was no checking of people's kosher level in their homes. In their in homes, homes. Um, but there was. It sounds like. Not just tolerance, but it was people could do whatever they wanted in their private lives. Is that right? Definitely, definitely. Kashrut or Shabbos right. or any other right. kind of observance. Right. Right. Okay. Um, was was this community also an inviting community in the sense that uh, the the occasions or ways in which the community gathered went beyond what happened at the in the Havara apartment itself? For instance, did people invite each other to their homes for Friday night dinner? There was a lot of, in my opinion, there was a lot of uh, Shabbos home hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, there were, particularly by the first, I don't know when, there were a lot of couples. And um, then you had the first two children. The first child was a Sperling, Sharon Sperling, 
I would say that was 1971. Then Ilana Ruskay, uh, Ilana, then Sugarman, uh, which was of January of 72. So that was a whole new, f that was, uh, so I'm just trying to track this back. 69 fall, we get going. And in 71, the first child is arriving, hmm. Sharon Sperling. So, but she was pregnant X months before. So that represented, but the answer to your question, there, was a lot, there were a lot of Shabbos entertaining, particularly what I'm going to say among the couples. Um, and or those that were more strictly Shema Shabbos. So the extent to which they were single people like myself, some would or would not at that stage go out or have, make other plans. Others wanted to be in a family setting like that. So they would come, they would be invited. Right. Right. Um, so we've talked about retreats a little bit um, and how important they were, but um, can you try and convey something of what the atmosphere was like at these? What, what happened? What was going on at these retreats? And what ma many people have described the, the, the Shabbat retreats, the monthly retreats, as more or less the heart of the New York Havara. I think that's correct. You know, what your question evokes the following thought, which is someone sa some people, people have said, camp people are camp people forever. <laughs> so the extent to which many people in the Chavara had shared Jewish summer camp, much of it Ramah, not entirely, the retreat approximated that. And it approximated it with growing familiarity and caring about one another, a group of broadly shared values, excuse me, and I would add uh, that a group that both davened seriously and it's overnight tikkun was kind of serious and had fun. You know, Shabbos afternoon we'd have touch football games huh. and um, people there, mentioned hiking. Hiking, it was fun. Yeah. So. It was kind of a retasting of camp. I mean, I said earlier, I said earlier today that the mobilization in Washington was confirming. I think this was confirming. No one said this. This is why we did it. To create this kind of personal, intense Jewish community that we were creating and we imagined would be a model long for the future. But holding that aside, it was just pleasurable. People cared about each other. The davening was usually quite, wasn't always exquisite, but it was quite good. Making Shabbos dinner, smirot, benching, and the one-on-one -on -one talks, the one-on-three talks, getting up in the morning, um, A study, people prepared divrei Torah. Was it often in camp-like settings? Yes, almost always. I mean, we basically uh, used, thank the Lord for the Protestant camps. It's like, you know, in Manhattan, you, you wouldn't have Jewish life right now in Manhattan if you didn't have churches that were open for synagogues to rent them. So we were often at Protestant camps. Occasionally Eisner, but Eisner was further. So we rented. It was winter. You'd make You'd have fire, make fireplaces. We'd make fires and keep them going. So this was also one of the issues that needed resolution. People have right. said whether or not there could be a fire right. made by a Jewish person. Well, I think it was started before Shabbos. Anyway, there was those kinds of things, but it was a, um, and you would try to have, apropos of what I said about Rama one on one, try to have a meaningful conversation about something of import with as many people, if not everyone. And it didn't feel good if you hadn't. Mm -hmm. Everybody didn't like each other. You know, everybody wasn't drawn to each other as much. They were very rich um, and wonderful. And I think, it was, I think they were more than the communal, weekly communal meals, which was, it was too harried. People dropped in, dropped out, came late, went early, had commitments the next day. This was, 
you know, Shabbos. It was Shabbos, and everybody had made the venture to create Shabbos and to be together. And as people um, were finding partners in the world, they could bring those those significant others to these. They did. I mean, you know, it's interesting. We. Um, my, this conversation is evoking the memory of who. So, to my knowledge, I mean, I mentioned she so had Sperlings and um, Sugarmans, and then Hunter Tier Two. Um, I'm trying to think of the couples, and I'm then trying to think about who coupled the people that coupled later. I don't know how many people brought girlfriends at different times. Uh, once in a while, someone brought a boyfriend. That is, a boy bought a boyfriend. That was its own. Uh, and many of us had had zero uh, experience with that in 1970 or 71. Hmm. Um, was that a subject of conversation at all? Or simply accepted? It, it was simply accepted. I mean, uh, period. It was simply accepted. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to think about the couples, uh, and when, you know, and as it would be very interesting, someone might, uh, I bet Phyllis Sperling might have, the years in which people were there and how they moved on, and different, you know, people were there, and then they, people got jobs out of, out of New York, they left, uh, etc., and then other people came in, I mean. And on these retreats, <coughs> Would most everybody try to go so that you'd have... Almost everybody. So it'd be like, I don't know, you say 20, 25 people as members in any given year. Is that right? That's yes, the death right. Thing. So you're talking about 25 to 40 people or something there like that? There weren't that many. Uh, I mean, there weren't that many couples. That's yeah. the, and everybody didn't come. I would say most retreats were in the 20 to 25 area. And um, actually, there was a discussion, actually at communal meals, about where we were on that number for the retreat in two weeks or one week or three weeks, and if we had a critical number, because at a certain point there was a financial, you had to rent the place, and did we have enough people? So once, I mean, I don't remember retreats in the early years being canceled, but I think later, commitments, kids, <clears throat> more so, but that issue of fiscal viability, um, and once people started having kids early on, like um, the Sperlings, et cetera, there were some small children at these retreats also. Did that change things at all? Well, by definition, it had to. Uh, well, sometimes it just changes it for the couple. Yeah, I think that uh, I think the group welcomed the kids. I think the couples were more exhausted. Then there were issues of sleep, you know, and noise and sleep, because some of these places were, you know, very small and, uh, and you know, there were times that everyone, I mean, there were bedrooms, and then there were times when mattresses were kind of around a fireplace, and everybody was out there. Now, with little kids, I don't think that worked. So, um, so kids obviously over time changed things. But I think kids, you could ask them. It's interesting, we never, that's, a ho that's something that would be interesting to do to interview some of the kids that grew up in this environment and what was it like for them? What did, how did it look? How did, how did they experience it? Right. Um, in addition to these weekly, I mean monthly uh, Shabbat retreats, starting in about 1973, I think, there were also periodic retreats several times a year um, at Weiss's farm that members of the New York Havara also participated in. Do you have any memories of those? Did you go to any of the retreats there? I did. There? I mean, um, I don't have the sequence, but you had Chavarat Shalom, New York Chavarat, and then for Fabre for Brangen, right, seventy-one. Seventy-one, and so the first impetus for that was to bring us together. So I do recall Weiss's farms and being there uh, for many, um, a number of the, I, I don't know how many, but two or three. Certainly, I went to, and um, was that different in feel? Would you say to the compared to the monthly? Oh yeah, I mean that was a different thing. That that you had the audacious imagination that a movement was emerging. 
I shouldn't say audacious magi. A movement was emerging, a force in Jewish life, which actually I believe has impacted synagogues. It's impacted Jewish life broadly. I don't want to overstate we'll, we'll it. come to that. Yeah. I don't want to overstate <laughs> or understate it. But you had the feeling, number one, that here are these three chavurot, quite different. Um, were emerging. What they shared, I think, was a shared commitment to participatory Jewish life, creating, actively creating Jewish life. And so this was not about our group coming, our chavurah coming together. It's about being with others, learning, hearing from each other, meeting. It was a quite different experience, in my memory, quite different experience, although you felt related to these other people. Did, you, did it feel like um, there were any outcomes or outgrowths of these um, retreats where there was some cross-fertilization of ideas and experiences uh, that affected you? For, for instance, somebody described uh, Tzedakah Collectives, the idea of Tzedakah Collectives, as being discussed at one of these retreats and then being instituted, certainly in New York. Well, I think, I mean, retrospectively, you know, as Ratan Hashim was emerging, so it was kind of sneezed in a setting like that. Do you know what I mean by sneezed? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Grodin terms. You know, word of it was, you talked about it and therefore others picked it up okay. and, wow, thought about it. Tzedakah Collectives. I think there was beginning to be thought issues about the kind of uh, Israel-Palestinian stuff. Brera was created in the fall of 73. So these ideas were kind of at different times discussed um, and shared, but it was a very, it was more of a, a little mini convention of Chavurot than one's own Chavura meeting and deepening, uh, deepening. Would you say, at least according to your recollections, that there were truly significant differences in the approaches of these three Chavarot, the original three? Well, you know, year one, the New York Chavarot traveled to Chavarot Shalom to Boston, and we had a Shabbos in Boston. Um, I don't want to speak for everybody. My recollection is that we came back and realizing this was a more serious religious consciousness going on here. From you meaning Chavar Shalom. From prayer to davening to... And we were less intense on those issues. Um... For good or for bad, and for Brangen was, uh, you know, the I think, Chavarat Shalom was heavily associated with um, with art, and I think for Brangen was heavily associated with author. Waskow. Waskow, and um, I don't think I think New York Chavara was didn't have someone like that for good or for bad. Um, I think we thought it was for good, but uh, there's nothing about it was just a different different model. Um, I think we imagined also, but this may or may not be correct, that Verbrengen was more, po more political than us. Um, we, we were about social engagement, but they, had a, they were more uh, Haredi in their political commitment. Um, um, and they were in Washington, D.C. And they were in Washington. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Arthur had done, I think, the Freedom Seder by then. He was part of the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, and some of the people, if I remember, Bob Agus and others, were involved in government stuff in a way that none of us were. Right, exactly. Okay, so uh, let, let's talk more specifically about the, the question of prayer, tefillah, um, in the, in the Chavara. Um, so you said you, you came to the Chavara, at least out of your, your Rama experience, with a strong love of davening in the right setting. How would you describe tefillah um, and the attitude towards tefillah uh, within the Chavara as it was getting started, the New York Chavara? <sighs> I 
I mean, it's an excellent question. It prompts in me the notion that I don't think the New York Havura had an attitude towards davening. I think it had davening times, spaces, etc., and individuals at totally varying places in their individual journey use the opportunity of being with Hevra to do it, to do their to do tefillah. But in other words, Ruven Kimmelman, I'm using, and this is a positive, and Alan Mintz were just more seriously engaged in davening, at that my memory is, than other still not members of the Chavura who either had been but sort of were not certain they were waiting for the Kiddush. And in, in, and I mean, a person like myself was probably in between. I was not a proficient like they were, yet I liked it and wanted to be into it. And was, I mean, in a certain kind of way, um, I was still learning. You know, the Chavra, for me, was still a place where I was learning uh, how to daven, how to feel comfortable studying text. I mean, it was a few years later, actually, that I started studying on a weekly basis with Richie Siegel. And for me, that was the, the first really interesting, mo- for whatever reason. In other words, much of the teaching, I know I'm swift, in New York Havra was, from my perspective, too philological in orientation. The Shoresh of this is related to that, there's this, this, that, you know, the textual analysis, the, the Wissenschaft approach, the science, the, the science of Judaism analyzing text. Um, when I started for the first time studying in a more serious way with Richie, I had studied a lot of text. I think we did less of that, although he had, was ahead of me on that. But we did more into the meaning and what Eric spoke to us, which we loved. Then later, yet, have I come to kind of feel the echo of text in the language. But that's an acquired taste that takes time to, to be comfortable with the language, which for me, because I never, I mean, other than the year at the seminary, my learning has been on the fly. Um, I've, and, but I have come to love the more textual language-based study that I couldn't get into at that stage. So on davening. So now I'm really comfortable with davening, meaning, but I was learning there. And, and, um, and I think I learned a lot in the Chavra. For, uh, about davening, about breathing, about experiencing the... What do you mean breathing? Breathing. I mean, we, we did word... Uh, there was, it was the 60s. Yeah. So. You, did breathe, you did... We didn't do a lot of it, but I meant just relaxing with tefillah. It was, there was a lot... There was quiet. There were long periods of... of in repetition of the Amidah that you spent with the text and yourself. I like that. It was just, I, took, I went to a different level, Madrega, of davening, and that continues in its own way. Yeah. I mean, I'm now in a very interesting shul where they take it to another level. Huh. Um, as you said, in the beginning, Shabbat services, Shabbat morning services were maybe every other week. Right, that's my memory. Mm-hmm. I think that lasted about a year. And then what happened after that? That there just weren't enough people, and people were going elsewhere, and it, it just stopped. So then it would be we would have Shabbos when we went on retreats, and occasionally at the times, maybe on Rosh Chodesh. But it, after a year or two, my recollection, there were no Shabbos morning services, rarely Friday night services, because people wanted to be home having Shabbos dinner. Right. So the main so. The main, that's why the main um, sort of tefillah experiences began Was, the retreats. Yes. And that, and that continued. <coughs> um, <coughs> while you were having services, and, and during the, sur- the tefillah at the retreats, would you say that people were um, experimental at all in the way they led services? There, you know, Chavarot are typically... Uh, described as sort of inhabiting this realm of tension between right. innovation and tradition. 
I do have recollection. I do recall that every once in a while there would be someone who would volunteer to lead a Kabbalat Shabbat or a Shabbos morning and do it in a uh, untraditional, excuse me, a way that was not part of the minhag of the Chavra. I would say the minhag of the Chavra was heavily Ramah. But that once in a while, you know, someone would do it and they'd uh, kind of want to read poetry. And they were free to. And they were free to, but it, I think, again, I think it often created some degree of discomfort. The group, there were a number of traditional oh, people liked the traditions that they had and felt, didn't feel great about having them disrupted. Yeah. Um, so I think that did lead to some conversations about the limits or should there be, how do we think about that together? And should we, be, should be the process, I vaguely remember, should there be a process of letting people know this is going to happen, so if they wanted to daven before or daven after. So, it was ha- so, but this very present conversation I'm having confirms kind of there was a notion of minhag, of the tradition of the way we daven. And so in theory, a number of people, any a person could come and do something quite different. Um, you know, obviously somebody with different times would bring readings or a poetry or a, but that's part of, you know, as part of the service. But once in a while there was someone that, you know, really would do something quite different. Can you remember any of those? Did Richard Siegel do something quite different at one point? Remember? He was a beautiful domino. Richard was a beautiful domino. It, it, that's not coming up. I mean, the more bizarre ones, are not bizarre, should, you know, are people that, you know, would kind of come and read a poem, and, you know, that was Kabbalat Shabbat. And right. Most people would think they might have been served the order, but, mm-hmm. and just so, uh, how to prepare for that or not, how to still leave roof, room for it. Can you elaborate on, on your comment just now that it was in the tradition, more or less, of Minhag Ramah in many ways. Well, first of all, what is Minhag Ramah, and how did this relate? You know, a kind of joyous Kabbalat Shabbat. Meaning singing? Singing and hugging and, you know, yeah. and uh, welcoming the Shabbat with a kind of quiet seriousness. Mm-hmm. And then Marivan, you know, following a little less joyous, but still full, full-hearted, the whole thing, you know, probably 40 minutes, an hour. Uh, I think, the, and, you know, you could, we could even, the tunes were kind of known, and many of them from Ramah, or if not Ramah. Now, the truth is, many of them are in, are in conservative and if for reform in some modern Orthodox synagogues today. So, I mean, I don't, but I think so many of the people had come from camps Friday night, Fila is an important piece of camp, and uh, that became kind of an expectation or informal or formal. Right. Let's look at the issue of gender and um, uh, women's roles in the context of communal worship, because when uh, the New York Havara first started, it was before Ezra Nashim was formed, and uh, as I said earlier, uh, Art Green had described this as a pre-fem- pre-feminist moment. What do you remember about the the um, attitude towards women's participation in in public worship and the roles that they played? You mean leading, laning, reading Torah. I, I mean, uh, Baal Tvila, you know, leading services, uh, being counted in a minion. I have slight memory only. I don't know what that reflects. I do reflect a, a, a member of the Chavra, and I don't know if she was a member or I think she was a member, was Arlene Agus. Okay. Mm-hmm. She's an exquisite davener. And Laner. So I do remember, was that year, when was that? Mm-hmm. Um, I think Phyllis loved to lane to her. And um, <coughs> I don't remember debates about it. So I don't, but I don't remember women leading tefillah too often. So I'm, I, 
You may have to head elsewhere. Well, in a way, it's confirming it was a pre-feminist moment. I mean, in some senses, people are saying that they it wasn't really in their consciousness. Right. They weren't thinking about it. Now, I'm not sure that that's true of the women, but certainly the, the men weren't necessarily right. thinking about it. And yet, many of the members, uh, women founders of Jewish feminism and what came, came, right came, came th from the New York cover up. Um, what's do you have recollections of that period, how uh, Ezrat Nashim was formed, um, and what its relationship was to the New York Havara, if any? Well, I may be, for, this may not be correct, and you know, obviously Liz, Colton, and others will have. I think Ezrat Nashim began as a study group of the New York Havara. So there were many different groups going on, people were studying different issues, studying different subjects, studying some studying text. This was a study group. Um, I think Liz was in it, and Arlene was in it, and Paula Hyman, Paula Hyman may she rest in peace, was in it. And um, which then I do recall them deciding to go to the RA convention. Now, I think that was 72, but I may be wrong. Is it 72? So that was, I mean, I do remember that being discussed at a communal meal. Communal. Uh, I mean, what, what was discussed? I don't know. We were planning to go, and we, you know, in other words, this was a study group of the New York Havara, which was about to go to the RA to make, to, to, um, you know, sort of nail on the doorpost a set of demands and concerns from Ezra and Hashim, which... Do you recall a, a, a moment or a, a period of time when this started become, to become more conscious for everyone, including the men in the community, or that it had the thinking that was going on in Ezra Nashim was having an impact on how you all as You're a It's a project. great question, because if they were going, I mean, I, if my recollection is correct, one of their important issues was women's ordination right from the outset. Mm -hmm. And if you were, I can't imagine those same people coming back and saying, you know, it's time for us here. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the question you're asking, or at least I want to, would love to know more about, which I don't, is mm -hmm. were there women who wanted to lead davening or Torah or read Torah yes. who were not able to do so in the New York Havara because they were precluded? One of two things precluded or they didn't have the skills to do it. No, no, but I meant for those I said, for yes. those who wanted to and had the skills, I meant, yes. mm -hmm. were, there, were yes. they able to or were they precluded? At, at any point, right? At, at, any point. Change at any point. And I'm blanking on that. Mm -hmm. I have no memory of them being precluded, but I don't have too many memories of them leading, uh, other than Arlene. Who, but you do have a memory, which is significant, of a discussion. I of, do, uh, not of those issues, but of, of them going. Exactly. Um, so it clearly came... Um, came up. Well, it was, it was part of the New York Havara. Right. And, and but let me not only say part of the New York Havara, I would say that, that Esrat Nashim, from the earliest, attracted a fierce interest and commitment on the part of the women that gathered around. Yeah. And was not the case in, in that many other issues. So the other part of that question is, as the, the women in, in this study group that became Ezra and Hashim were wrestling with these issues and trying to chart their course forward at the rabbinical assembly and elsewhere, um, in Jewish life, having an impact on Jewish life, speaking in synagogues, etc., increasingly. What impact, if any, what changes, if any, were happening within the New York Havara as a result of their um, growing consciousness and activism? At what point were men's consciousness being raised about these issues? When, at what point, for instance, did it did women start wearing telesim? Did they wear kippot? Were they counted in a minion formally? Was there ever a time that they weren't and then were? Um, 
when they more regularly took leadership roles in the service, whether it was reading Torah or leading. Well, I, you're going to need to ask others. Uh, I just my recollection is not clear on this stuff. Right, that's okay. Um, so we've talked a little about uh, study and learning, which was another one of the key pillars of the Chavura. Um, and the original brochure states very clearly that study and learning will be central to the life of the Chavura. Right. Um, so how did the Chavura seek to turn that vision into practice, both in terms of the content of the learning, but also the ways in which um, teaching and learning took place and the relationship between teachers and learners? The kinds of classes that were uh, offered. Um, what's coming up with your question, you asked very good questions, doctor, is um, at the outset I think there was an effort to have, reflecting kind of the overall vision of, um, of what we were trying to do, to have classes about community, about Judaism, and about social engagement or social issues, and at times where they linked. I mean, it's mind-blowing to recall that year one, again, we, and I don't know how long it went on, but among the teachers, I'm sure you've heard, Shlomo Riskin, Paul Goodman, uh, David Sperling taught, I think Ruben Kimmelman taught. I'm so certain. members who had expertise. So Ruben and David Sperling taught. Paul Goodman. Uh, Say who he is, Paul Goodman was. I mean, he's long past, but he was one of the leading sociologists of the 20th century. I mean, maybe that's overblown, but not much. Not much. I mean, just broadly regarded, one of the people who wrote endlessly in places like the New York Review of Books and other places. His brother was Percival Goodman, I think, a leading architect, um, and he was an engaged Jew in a non-traditional way and so we wanted him and he had written about community so we wanted to better understand the nature of community as he understood it um, I think Shlomo Riskin was engaged but somebody else could, on the evolution of Jewish law and where was Riskin at that Shlomo point? Riskin at that point was the founding rabbi of uh, Lincoln Square Synagogue and actually invited the New York Havara there to meet. I remember meeting with him. The, uh, Lincoln Square, as we know it, let me track. Lincoln Square was located at about 70th and Amsterdam Avenue for the better part of 45 years. It's just sold that property and built a new, very beautiful uh, synagogue two blocks south. But before there was the Lincoln Square synagogue, it, uh, it met an apartment of Shlomo Riskin's. That's where it met, you know. And we had a meeting um, with him, and he asked, he invited the whole Chavra, and the, his emerging synagogue met in some, like his apartment, in that constellation of apartment buildings there. Why was he interested in inviting the Chavra to come? Well, first of all, he was building a synagogue. So, excuse me, you'd have to ask him. Uh, <clears throat> He was, he was, you know, known as a kind of maverick, YU, prodigy, open. I mean, I would say at that point, as it appeared to me, he was the practitioner of open orthodoxy before it existed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I think obviously, need I say, in the 50 years that have passed, or 45, what has happened in the orthodox world has changed all of this. But mm -hmm. then... Um, he was, maybe he was trying to look, he saw Jewish energy, some of it was sort of traditional, and thought could it be brought in. I don't know what was his motivation, but our motivation is he was already a person speaking, a little bit like Yitz Greenberg, pushing the limits of orthodoxy about women, about social engagement, about text, etc. And, and he was young, he was our age, I mean he was a young, charismatic guy. Mm -hmm. 
and by the way, a number of uh, a number of people recently in the last six months told me they still recall the class I taught on Zionism. Tell us about that. <clears throat> well, I'm sure. I mean, I have um, taught at different stages about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the emergence of Zionism. So we probably in a slow way read text, read Hertzberg, the introduction, read some of the texts, got into conflicting narratives. And for many of those folks, it was, I mean, I remember many folks, uh, including sometimes on Friday night or Shabbos retreats, <coughs> they just had never heard this before. And, uh, you and hadn't been living in the gray. Had, had not been. Mo few had in 1970, 71, 72. Right, this is before the right. Yom Kippur War. Right. So, uh, so, I mean, but, so some of these classes I'm sure were amazing. I don't remember them all. Uh, I remember studying with David Sperling. What did you study with him? I think we studied, I mean, this is, <laughs> you know, um, Shmuel or Shoftim. But um, it was a textual, pretty heavy text, and I still was grappling with it. He was a great teacher. Um, how, how would the roster of classes get decided, and how many classes were being taught? At any communal meals time? was actually also a time when roster, new class, classes are beginning for the fall but sometimes it would dissipate, then another class would be added. In other words, it was kind of rolling admissions. But I mean, there were, not entirely, but there was a certain aspect of that. Uh, or people, I'd like to study this, how many would want to, which and is a whole... how many people would it take to, to, for a class to be put together? Four or five. So if a few people were interested. Absolutely. And if the teacher was someone other than one of you, one of the members, how did the outreach to that person, how, what would incentivize I think somebody to might have, or I recall people coming to a communal meal saying, X person is willing or is open or would like to, who would want to. So we said, look, I'm already doing three classes. I got my other job and I, I can't do it now. Can we put it off? So it was a, I would not, I mean, let me say that you had a question before about the conceptualization. I have no idea how they did it in a Chavarat Shalom, but we did not have, for good or for bad, someone assigned to sort of, who's the, I don't mean dean, but who's the person who conceptually is going to try to make certain we have a class on X, Y, Z, who the, no, and this was much more for good or for bad, ad hoc, evolving from interests of students, availability of teachers, the, uh, just what, who crossed paths with whom? And it was for the members? For the members. Occasionally someone else would sit in, but that was occasionally. Right. So not like... Or sometimes or someone who wanted to join might take a class and that would lead to, I, see. I want more. Mm -hmm. So someone could? Yes. From the outside, at least on a limited basis? <clears throat> well, I think as time went on, boundaries became reduced wasn't going to become the alternate seminary community giving, it was more of an informal, or I shouldn't say informal, it was more of a voluntaristic Jewish community of intentionality and intensity of X, Y, and Z elements, and therefore it didn't have any of the, you know, the notion that this was, we were about to ordain people, by a certain point it was, it was just not real, we weren't giving degrees, so we were really, uh, you know, kind of, you know, they call it urban kibbutz. I don't mean it that way, but a, a kind of urban, small Jewish community. That must have taken the pressure off of any notion of needing to conceptualize a, cur a curriculum that had any coherence. It and I would say in candor, and others, I think over time the classes became fewer. And this basically became a Shabbos retreat communal meal, 
discussion at different times, discussion on study, short term, but I think the classes study, you didn't have Paul Goodman's teaching 10 years later. I don't mean Paul, I mean that, it just didn't happen. Right. You had speakers coming, you had, so the classes I think became less, so the ordaining I think evolved, or dissipated, and the, the notion of classes as an ongoing way, I think people were just it wasn't happening. People were studying elsewhere. Some were at the seminary. Some were at HUC. Some were at Columbia. I think that doesn't mean there weren't serious divrei Torah. It was a serious study on a retreat. There weren't occasional important discussions at communal meals on subjects or extended for a few weeks, mm -hmm. which went on also. We continue a discussion would begin and you'd continue, but the notion of classes, the way I mentioned it, year one, I think over time weakened, uh, dissipated. Same thing you were saying happened to uh, Shabbos morning services. Exactly. Um, exactly. So it was sort of becoming distilled to an, an essence, so to speak, of what, what was going to hold this group together. Social engagement around Shabbos, Chagim, and creating Jewish community. There you go. Okay. Um, so I want to go back and touch again on the issue of social justice and political activism. Um, which which we began to we began discussing with because you were so deeply involved in political activism yourself and uh, you know Meredith Wucher described the Chavura as living at the nexus of political and religious values and that's in essence what you've been describing too in many ways. Um, What were you seeking from the Chavara in terms of political activism? You were continuing to be politically active in a variety of ways. <coughs> yes, but you know, um, sorry. So, A, what were you involved in outside of the, your, your classes at Columbia? By this time you were uh, doing your work in your PhD in Middle Eastern... Right, politi political pol science, Middle East science. Question and you were involved in the Chavara, and you were also still very engaged in political activities. But for most of it, out of, uh, out of the Chavara. In out other of words. the Chavara. But yes, some Chavara yes. people, I mean, the period, I would say, of 73 to 75, was in, you know, six, seven, was intense. Brera was intense. Uh, we created Brera in the fall of 73. Go back for a minute and, and talk a little bit about the, your own evolution from sort of post-67 and where you were. You, you described yourself as an as a early dove. You were on the left in terms of Israeli, uh, the is Israel-Palestine. I think I, um, I think I mentioned that when I took a course in 66 or 67, I realized shortly thereafter, actually it wasn't that, it was when I read Hertzberg the first time. And in Hertzberg's introduction, he has a very interesting... Hertzberg's book? Arthur Hertzberg's Zionist Idea. It's a very interesting section which, which talks about the fact that it, what, uh, what led to the emergence of Zionism was the emergence in Central and Eastern Europe of conservative, even racist nationalism, which precluded uh, the Jew from being part of it. In other words, Napoleon sweeps across Europe, tells Jews, come on out in the ghetto, you can be part of, you know, society. But later on, in Central and Eastern Europe, beginning in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, Wagner, von Schnur, others, um, a kind of conservative re reaction emerges to this, which says, no, we want our nation, our, our nationalism to be based on blood. So that increasingly in Central and Eastern Europe precludes and reads the Jew, reads Jews out, which in part, Hertzberg is arguing, leads to the emergence of Zionism. I at first had a uh, cope uh, with the fact that, wow, the Zionism that prevails is also a conservative nationalism. 
there is a liberal national. There was a liberal Zionism, which actually was binationalism, which had more support than any of us think did. In the, in the issue of as late as the mid forties, nineteen forties. 38-40% of those in the Yeshuv and in Histadrut voted for political parties broadly supportive of binationalism. But the, the Zionism that prevails is a conservative nationalism. So first I had to cope with that, since I was a true liberal. And I came to accept it as part of the historical necessity. I thought Jabotinsky's argument that while it was not perfect, the Arab states did have a huge other number of states. So it, it's not perfect, but I came to terms with that. But then I also, through study of other things, I came to the view post-67, all occupations produce resistance, period. All occupations produce resistance. And therefore, if we were going to help Israel be the Jewish democratic state proclaimed in its Declaration of Independence, we ought to do everything we can to end an occupation. At that point, when people wanted to talk about Palestinians, not only would Golda, who was then the Prime Minister, say there are no Palestinians, but she would say, Yesh bre, ra, there is no alternative. So I began with a group of people. I had been involved from... So I was searching for this after 67. Where could you deal with this? There was no place in the Jewish community I was aware of. So I did associate myself with something called the Committee on New Alternatives in the Middle East, CONAME. When was CONAME founded? I don't know. But right in that period? I thought before, but uh, I don't know. And it had a, my, and so I was then teaching Hebrew school at the seminary in the Chavra and early on realized this was way too far out of the Jewish community to have an impact on anything that mattered. In other words, Konaim was out in the peace community, out in the fellowship of reconciliation community. <clears throat> but if you wanted to impact the Jewish world, and so the, the impetus for Brera begins. Now, you mentioned about X time ago that there was um, there were Weiss's Farm conclaves. There was actually another interesting conference organized by Rabbi Stephen Shaw who ran something called, or later created something called the Radius Institute. <clears throat> and he organized an interesting conference in Rutgers in 1973. Okay. Uh, before, in the spring of 73. So before the war. And Art was, uh, Art was there, Arthur Waskow was there, a lot of, so there was some overlay of the Chavarot, but there, it was a very interesting, Steve Shaw is a very interesting guy, and it was an interesting gathering of people about sort of creating the new Jewish, the Jewish community of the future. And it wasn't specifically focused on, the, on Israel. Not at all, but there was a session on it. That's where I met Stephen P. Cohn, who became a dear friend who just died. And that's where we had a serious conversation. And from that, and it was a lot... In this class, this it was, session. It was a large session. I believe it was on Shabbos afternoon. Um, there was a, it was a large session, and people said, we ought to do something. And from that... I and others, but I principally took the impetus to create Brera. Uh, now, I did that with people, and I linked to people. I remember going to the airport because Steve Cohn was going to Israel for the year. I tried to get him to sign on to the opening Brera statement. The opening Brera statement opens with, Israel is the name of a state, a people, and a, the land, a people, and a state. The, not only and it gets into the need to discuss these matters, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And Stephen P. Cohen, very brilliant, did not sign on then because he felt we didn't understand enough about the nature of the American Jewish community and how they respond to it. <laughs> um, so from, so I had been involved in Co-Name. A little bit the McGovern campaign of 72. They'd asked me if I'd be a delegate. I mean, that was, uh, so I was involved in that, the Allard Lowenstein campaign of 72. So I was involved in politics. I was involved in, uh, in the co-name and then the startup of Bray Ra. And I was getting a PhD, trying to get a PhD. Busy guy. Busy guy. It was all good. Were you married by then? No. No, still no. Um, the... 
the early, early, the very beginnings of Ray Ra, had what kind of a relationship, if any, would you say, to the New York cover-up? Well, the first office of Ray Ra was in our apartment. And I was living with uh, Jerry Serrata. And in the apartment. In the apartment. No, not the Havra apartment. We had an apartment but as students at 120, uh, 111th Street, 529 West 111th. I called it a walk-in off the fire escape. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so our first office was there. And somehow, somebody linked us to a guy named Bob Loeb. And we hired Bob Loeb as the first director of Bray Ra. And he worked in, the, in an unused, I mean, it was a tiny apartment. I think the rent was 90 bucks. In the other bedroom. In the well, this was not the the New York Havra apartment. This was 111. Ah. This was our apartment. It was not the New York Havra. Ah. It was Jerry Serrata and I lived as roommates at 529 West 111th Street. So Bray Ra was in your apartment. In our apartment, in a little room, which was a, it was a tiny room. In uh, that was where it began, and eventually, six months later or so, moved out. But we began it there, and. Bob Loeb was hired as staff, mm -hmm. and can you talk a little bit though about, um, as I as I said, the, the relationship of Breira to, to the Chavura to the to the Chavura and to Chavurot because there were others who were involved. There was a substantial overlap. Uh -huh. That's a really interesting question. I mean, on the founding committee of Breira, Jerry Serrata. Peter Geffen. Now, these are now, by now, we're in 72-3, all people around the New York Harbor, uh, David Saperstein. Who uh, became the director of the RAC, right? And just the ambassador for religious freedom, just finished, but... Um, mm -hmm. um, Alan Mintz was on the original committee, Bray Ra, later wrote a demure in Response magazine about Bray Ra. Um, People associated with Fabrengan. Arthur Waskow, deeply involved. Uh, Max Tickton. Max Tickton. So there were Hillel rabbis. Right. Who were involved, a, a number. Well, we went after, we went out to get an advisory board, etc., rabbis, Hillel rabbis, etc. But your point about the, I mean, Breira was, many of us involved with Breira, but it was not. I guess the question is, it's true we had traveled together, so to speak, but I do not recall, I don't think of Bray Ra having a lot of space at 98th Street. Doesn't mean we didn't on occasion have a discussion about it, but I don't recall a lot of uh, discussion about it, although, actually, as I think about it, because what happened then, to take another element, is that I get married, what, I connect that? with well, I connect with and uh, with Shira then Sugarman, a member of the New Chavra. We connect in 1975. We get married, mm -hmm. and we actually drift off from the Chavra. Her ex-husband Alan Sugarman stays in it, so we just drift off. We actually get involved with some other things. So there is more discussion of Bray Ra may have taken place in there that I we weren't really around at that point. Although we later came back. Uh, when he left. But um, so one of this Bray Ra is created in 73, 74, 75. Uh, Shira and I get together in 74, and we sort of drift off, uh, etc. So I, I, you'd have to ask others if the Bray Ra, which heated up in, with intensely with the communal attacks on Bray Ra. And you were still involved with it then? Deeply involved. Deeply involved. I'm deeply involved as a you know, volunteer, so to speak, but deeply involved. Um, Bray Ra finally falls apart in, let's say, 77. Right. But I stay deeply involved with Bray Ra through the whole time. Mm -hmm. I, I ended up being the person, because we had debt, that, that gets every board member to put in two years of, you know, we had no money. People didn't have money, so we had debt, actually. So I took care of helping to close it down. So the relationship, I would think there were many fellow travelers to Bray Ra in the New York Havara. But I want to also say that there were many others who were not political. They thought Bray Ra was 
too far out for them. They had not yet either wanted to or struggled through issues or came to a different place. Um, so uh, in other words, so that's why I think it didn't occupy, the, yes, many of us were involved in the Chavra, but also for Brengen, some from uh, Chavra Shalom. Um, but it didn't occupy that much space at 98th Street. And the, I mean 98th Street is the Chavra or on retreats or whatever. And it didn't, the, the positions that Brera uh, took, took and you might want to say what they are briefly, didn't come up for discussion? This wasn't a... I would imagine that we may have, you know, taken the original statement and have reviewed it and read it and s discussed what it meant. Just say briefly what the what Bray Ra stood for and where, where, where it was trying to take Well, Bray Ra was a, the first effort to try to open discussion in the American Jewish community about a range of issues facing the state of Israel and the Jewish people. They included how to deal with the Palestinians, the, Ash the divide of Ashkenaz and Sfard, the uh, divide of secular and religious, and the appropriate relationship of North American Jewry and Israeli Jewry. So that was the opening statement, which was trying to, I think it was a call for forum for discussion, a call for discussion. And we had, you know, we probably got 60 very prominent rabbis to endorse it on the advisory committee. You know, Joachim Prinz, rabbi, I mean these names, Robert Brickner. 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 Well, Brickner was involved in the active working committee, but the advisory committee was Joachim Prinz and uh, Robert Gordis. These were huge names in the community. Probably got 50 of them. We had a little editorial support of the New York Times. It was getting, it was building support. Um, we then um, took a position when Arafat came to the UN and um, I believe this was like a demonstration against terror or something. I don't remember this exactly. Mm -hmm. And we put out a statement and people, I did not, was not one of them, leafleted the rally saying all Palestinians aren't terrorists and we have to somehow figure out what we're going to do with a community that's being occupied, that wants its independence and live in peace. And that freaked out the far right, who then, in my view, uh, did a pretty intense assault on Brera, from my perspective, doing a bit of character session, you know, because Ruske had been involved with Koname and Noam Chomsky was with Koname, therefore Ruske, and I never met Noam Chomsky, but, uh, uh, and ditto on, on Arthur Waskow and a few others. And this was commentary, and this was, et cetera. So it was a pretty serious, so things got hot. I don't know if, I don't know where the Chavara was at at that point. Mm -hmm. And it was not a, a subject of much discussion, it sounds like. Well, the, the attack was late. I, I wasn't there then. Later, at the time. So I don't know, because mm -hmm. I don't know. You'll have to ask. Mm -hmm. There are other people. You see, this good, bad, this oral history is about people during the original years. Yes. We're now after five years. I mean, meaning this, we're talking about 75, 6, 7. Mm -hmm. This is a later period, and there are other people involved. Uh, Rabbi David Ellenson was then a member of the group. Mm -hmm. Interesting folk were there. We'll have to see. Um, so I just want to come back for one minute to this, the question of the Chavara vision as a laboratory, as a for a, a nexus of um, between religious concerns and uh, socio-political issues of the hour, which was seen originally as one of the key key pillars. People were looking for a way to, in the '60s, late '60s, to express their their views, their activism within a Jewish context for many reasons, both because particularism was becoming more. Uh, acceptable and diversity was a hotter thing, sexier thing. It was black separatism had been pushing things in a certain direction also. Um, and looking back, how successful do you think the Chavara was in, in fulfilling this aspect of its vision? This sort of nexus of religious and uh, political. Well, you and I haven't discussed, which I will now discuss, that I don't stand with all of 
my comrades or colleagues and friends in the Jewish community claiming <clears throat> or I w- that Jewish values lead me to do this. As I said, in certain ways I was a liberal before I was a Jew, as I've recounted. And I actually find often, both sides, liberals and conservatives, that they often like to use text to justify politics arrived at independently. So, um, that said, I know I was seeking to have a place where the, the search for Kedusha and sacred community and my political concerns were shared. I thought that would be, I mean, it does come from that impetus, and I think you're in the 60s, that sort of create the commune, create the small, intensive, intimate community. On the one hand, you're asking now how successful that was. You're asking how successful it was back then or now? I mean, how back. I mean, look, let me put it this way. I'm now a member of two, two synagogues. One has about 3,000 members, and the other has, let's say, 1,500. <laughs> but both of them are more intimate, more participatory, a total different... In other words, I think the, the core messages of the Chavra about ending the cathedral-like synagogue, more participatory Jewish life, um, more presence has actually been introduced to many, not all, of congregations and other institutions, or is still going on. That said, there are also many, many, to, and I think we contributed to this, large congregations that have small minyanim meeting all over them, which never took, I mean, it's out maybe in the Orthodox community, certainly did not take place in the Reform and Conservative Synagogue community that I'm aware of when I was, quote, growing up. Still growing up, but growing up. <laughs> so the combination of multiple minyanim taking place in Reform and Conservatives, the tolerance for that, now where'd that come from? It came from the fact that big institutions wanted to, saw this energy and wanted to invite it in. Mm-hmm. And I'm aware that in each of those settings, negotiating that relationship was not always done easily, both sides. But in scores, if not more, I mean, I, would, I don't know how many, Reform and Conservative Synagogues, there are multiple minyanim. Often called chavarot. Often called chavarot. Ditto, I think, not all, but most um, many large congregations have become influenced in terms of prayer, study, engagement by the Chavara movement. So I think, I don't know what to say. I mean, I think the, the core input, if, if the impetus for creating the Chavara movement was creating something that worked for us, for a period of time it worked for us. If the impetus was to have an impact on American Jewish life, either by replicating it or by impacting the institutions, the major institutions of Jewish life, my own intuition is it's done more the latter than the former. But I may be wrong. You know, there's a lot of independent, out there, non-institutional life, Jewish life that's going on that's very difficult to catalog. Yes. We're uh, in a period that highlights the startup and the new in- institution, and I think it understates the continuing role of large legacy institutions in continuing, for good or for bad, to shape Jewish life. That said, it's a changed by definition, look, 50 years have changed. Mm-hmm. I think many, not all, of these institutions have been changed much for the better. Okay. So that was a great segue into our final part of our conversation here about the impact of the Chavara, um on yourself personally and, and on the larger um, Jewish community. Okay. Um, so you were saying, I want to get a picture of to what extent you continue to be involved in the New York Harbor Ross. So you were saying once you and Shira, Shira were married in 75, you sort of drifted away from right. it. Um, did you ever come back into the New we York We did Harbor? come back, but um, it was a different... 
excuse me, we never came back into whatever the Chavara had been. It, but it, had been, it was a changed Chavara. Everybody was older. It was more diffuse. I mean, by... Um, I mean, we did, Shir and I did maintain relations with many of the people in the Chavara. Go to Simchas. By the time, by the 80s, I don't think, you'll have to check this elsewhere, I think the apartment was long ago. I don't know. I, the apartment was long. How long did the apartment last? After my period here, so I don't really know. Right. Um, but so, my, my impression is that, you know, after 10 years or so, it was something, it, yeah. It was... It was gone. Right. I, so by that point, so we came back, so to speak, into, Shira and I, into relationship with many of the people. Friendship, Shabbos dinner, etc., Simchas, etc. Many of whom had also moved on into some other uh, configuration. configuration. Some people do say that they ask them, what, what was the period of your involvement in the New York Cobra? And they'll say 1970 to the present. By which I understand them to mean that there has been an ongoing um, <coughs> right. lunch or something. We have like not. That. Uh, I mean, um, Shira, my wife, died in 1998. We married in 2000. I mean, I don't... The last years of my life with Shira, I don't think we were there often, occasionally at the Rosh Hashanah, and almost, not never, but almost never now. Now, I know for some others that continues to be an important, the Rosh Hashanah dinner, I don't know how many events there are, and um, continues to be, I mean... Just my life just got projected. Uh, you know, I still feel I care about those people. I'd be there. I occasionally see them at different things, but I'm not involved in that at this point. But I feel like it was a very important time and experience in my life. Did you become in, involved in other Havarot or, or what? What sort of kinds of Jewish worship communities were you involved in? Well, I think mostly. I mean, by actually uh, by the '90s, we were uh, members of Bnei Jeshurun. And uh, that became an important place for us. And I consider myself quite close to uh, Roli and I'm sure then died and uh, remarried. And uh, we remain members of BJ. Now, one of the things that happens is Robin and I have bought a place in the country, which is not great for shul attendance. <laughs> and uh, so we're up, there's, we're also involved with the synagogue upstate called the Woodstock Jewish Congregation. but. Peripherally, but there at times it's a wonderful place. Also, now are members of Romamu in New York, which I don't know. Say what? Romamu is a wonderful congregation at um, with a very another another wonderful rabbi, terrific davening, a little more meditative in style. But we, Robin and I, my new wife, not doing it 15 years now, 18 years, <laughs> uh, but it's not new anymore. Um, we went on a wonderful retreat with BJ for meditation and davening and study for a week to Costa Rica. And uh, meditation has become an important part of our practice daily. And we've done uh, not many, um, med not many, but many meditation retreats. Um, and therefore Romamu, which integrates that more, and there's mindfulness work now at BJ, uh, which is also going on. So that we're... So we're sort of in a different place on that. Um, Are there other ways in which you feel like your um, your own sort of ideas about spirituality and observance have diverged significantly from what where you were in the those early days at the New York Chabra, what you were looking for, what your practice is actually? Oh, that's a great. I mean, look, I a very important Briefly. part has been uh, getting quieter which is the meditation work, you know, and maybe that's age-related, you know. Could be. Um, you know, I was, we were kids, we were 22, 23, 24. Yeah. We were kind of screaming to the hills. Now we're, uh, as someone said, the runways are getting shorter. It's been a privilege to have the life and lead the life and do the work I've done. It's been a, a privilege. Um, I feel very positive about it. I mean, in a certain way, in some of what I wrote, about, I've written at different times, that 
I consider myself a Chavara Jew, and that is what continued to frame my work as the CEO of UJ Federation of New York. So you've had this long. Uh, let me just finish. I mean, I was at, how to help people, mm -hmm. motivate people. Can we become a resource for people creating Jewish life which works for them? And that notion of actively being a creator as opposed to simply an attempt to be a consumer is, I think, a very key part of what camp was about, what the Chavra was about, about you know, what we've done. I was very pleased to lead in leading this federation. There are others to become deeply involved with helping to strengthen synagogues, transform synagogues, invest in synagogues. I mean, that before people like myself and others got here just didn't take place. Mm. So, um, you know, the impetus, that imp that notion, I mean, the first article I wrote when I came here was called To Create and Inspire being, UJ Federation. You, you, let's say a few words about your career, because you've alluded to it without saying it, and someone listening to this 50 years from now won't know what you're talking about. So, um, well, when I became, when I, achieved, when I received my PhD by 1975, actually 77, I realized that I was too much of an activist to want to do more research, even though... And by then I had been teaching Hebrew school. I got offered to be the executive director and education principal of the Hebrew school at the SAJ. And I always say that was my best job. <laughs> because 40 years later, people come up to me and say, you changed my life. And whatever I've done, and, and I've done a lot of interesting things, it's mostly indirect. And Subsequently, I was there. I was the executive vice president of the Jewish Reconstructions Foundation for two years. For six years, I was education director of the 92nd Street Y during a glorious period. I was then eight years as vice chancellor for public affairs of JTS. So back to JTS. So the first non-rabbi, nevertheless rabbinical school dropout. Is that uh, true? Yeah. And then I came here to work on the issue originally of Jewish education. Here being UJ, UJ Federation, Federation of New York. So after the 1990 study, there was a, a population study which reflected the dramatic increase of intermarriage. There was focus in the community on how to strengthen Jewish education, strengthen the likelihood of positive Jewish education identity. UJ Federation had a whole work on that. They invited me to come lead that. And I came four jobs back to lead what was then the Jewish Continuity Commission, working with a varying thing. And in 1999, became the CEO, for which I served for 15 years. The first talk I gave when I came here, or the first article I wrote when I came here, was called To Create Inspired Community. The creating Inspiring to, Communities. To Create Inspired Communities. Okay. And I argued the challenge at hand, let me say it differently. Everybody, most people after 1990 said the, the way to respond to the challenge of intermarriage and assimilation is Jewish education. Okay. And I argued, if you haven't been raised in a committed family and have been, or committed community, why learn this stuff? What's needed is to participate in inspired, something inspiring that touches your heart and soul that says, I want to participate in this community. Otherwise, there's no incentive, you're saying. Why do I need to learn this stuff? Unless I want to participate in the community. And for those not raised in inspired places, inspired communities, inspired, or committed families, why learn this? Because we say it's important? So I argued that the transformation, the challenges, how, and I of course cited Rama as how, what does it mean to try to create inspired places for Jewish learning and Jewish living? And I think among the key places are key gateway institution of synagogue, center, camp, Hillel. And so that notion, so Rama framed and how to increase the participation, reduce barriers to what clearly are the most inspired examples of Jewish living and learning summer camps, Israel trips, youth groups, informal Jewish education. So you've got a, a photo that's right over your shoulder there. Tell us what that photo is. Well, that's my bunk in uh, 1961 at Camp Ramah. And uh, I keep it here. In your office. Right in my office to, well, just as a reminder of the wonderful people I was at camp with and that the power of that experience. And I've... Uh, it's, it initiated the journey. In other words, what I think 
in Jewish life we need to do. And there's a wonderful group of people, some of my the colleague, some of my campmates, we were 14, 15 years old, but this is Dr. Jonathan Wucher, who for 25 years led Jesna, Jewish education, whatever, of North America. Uh, Cantor Rosenblum, Cantor of the, uh, Dean of the Cantor's Institute, JTS, Carl Woken, rabbi, a uh, rabbi in Chicago. What came from this bunk? And we were all, most of us, almost all of us, none of us had been at day school or anything. We were all Hebrew school kids. Um, or most of us. I don't think there were. Um, so, if you're not raised in this, what initiates the Jewish journey, the educational, spiritual journey? And uh, I think that's the challenge opportunity of our time. Can we create? Um, so, um, when you look back at your experience at Ramah and then later in the New York Kabbalah, um, do you see a direct connection between Ramah and the Chavara and what you see as the, 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 the challenges that we have ahead in the totally. 21st century? We live in the most open society where Jews have ever lived. In other words, when I was growing up, well, let me step back. I said this earlier. We have Napoleon sweeping through, Jews come on out, we live in the open society. And so Reform Judaism, Conservative Judaism, and Zionism are in their own ways related to how are we going to live in the open society? And those ideologies get brought to North America with the Great Migration of 1880 to 1920. And Jews do incredibly well here in every dimension. We build movements, we build institutions, we do well economically. And we think we're doing well, which we are, but we are still a somewhat protected community even though we could go to the best universities and we could go to the best law firms and everything else because social norms in America among all groups kept us as, uh, as a kept community. Everybody married within, Germans, Swedes, Italians, Catholics and Protestants. You could get out, but it was not so easy. 1960s, all of that comes tumbling down. Everybody's marrying everyone. So for the first time, as Rachel Cowan first said, we're Jews by choice. Everybody, and so that means Everybody's a Jew everybody. Person. So, therefore, can you create? I always say, can we create Jewish life that is sufficiently inspiring that Jews will choose to self identify not because they have to, they don't, not because of guilt, they have little, but because of the meaning and purpose and Kedusha that they find? That's the challenge opportunity. For me, I learned that there. One of the and the New York Havara was a place to try to say, could we create that kind of community that would work for us? And I think we did. For us, it was a brief time. Okay, and I've gone on to try to do it professionally and have found those settings. But it was all part of this, and that's where I first tasted it. Right. Picking up on what you just said, um, some some Havara members have commented that looking back on the impact that the Chavara had, that one of the, the salient features that was perhaps a weakness was that it was not an institution in, this, in the sense that it, right. therefore most of these Chavara changed dramatically. Even Fabrengen, which continues to exist to this day, and Chavarat Shalom are dramatically different from what they were in the early days, and your Chavarat doesn't exist in the same way. Um, and you went on to uh, run a big institution. Run a big institution. You former radical, radical, con continuous radical, perhaps. But you're here. You are sort of. At I was the just a liberal, liberal Democrat. It's only the Jewish community that thought I was a revolutionary. Right. Why here? Why, why the particular choices? What do you see as the thread from Ramah, Chavara to running the New York well, I, I Federation? Again, much of what I tried my leadership to be was to be here, but how could we come, become a resource for creating inspiring, and I would add, caring communities? Mm -hmm. So what I learned there, I took and took and infused, if you read the endless things I've written and spoken, I've written about it in spades. But I want to, you've asked an interesting question. Um, 
which is many of the startup communities are start and they come and they go. Exactly. And you're at one of the large. You've been you devoted twenty plus years to one of the largest institutions. Some call it uh, the establishment. Because you you were just giving us some of the, the statistics of what this organization raises. Yeah, but I actually think yeah. for reasons I told you that it's the counterculture because it's about collective responsibility. It's not about it's it's a counter to the individualism. It's about the wisdom of crowds, not the notion that an individuals individuals which have become equated with wisdom. But mm -hmm. holding that aside, um, I'm a person that believes in inside out. There are times you need to be outside, in, but I probably believe that ultimately, I mean, why did I go to the, why did I go back to the seminary? From 90 Seconds Street Y, back to the seminary. Because I had developed a relationship with Gershon Kohn then the Chancellor. And I thought he and I had deep conversations about halacha and what, was that, and what it meant to train rabbis. And even though he was asking me to be a vice chancellor for public affairs, he was an aide in that and I wanted to help him do that. How do you transform the large institutions? Right. And he was into that. Shortly after I came, he announced because of his illness he had to step down. Subject for another day. But so in the end of the day, even though there are great things, start, uh, startups out there and things going on outside, I think large institutions continue to shape more of America and the Jewish community than we sometimes like to acknowledge. So sometimes you go out, demonstrate potential, it can affect them, as I think the Chavarot have done to many of the synagogues. I think tzedakah collectives and startups are, and all the foundations are good. As I told you earlier, I think one of the stories of the last 20 years is the continuing strength of federations in a period of post-Israel at risk, at least for federation dollars. Not that we don't do good things, right. it's just it's a different context than in the 1950s and 60s. So what does this mean? It means inside-outside. I mean, I'm not, I know you <laughs> use the word radical. I actually wasn't a radical. I was a liberal Democrat. Um, you know, my friends uh, in college, some of them were in SDS. Why, why was I working with the McCarthy campaign and the Kennedy campaign and civil rights? Why weren't we for blowing it up? So I was for never blowing it up. I was working. I was always about inside outside. Mm -hmm. But I think the power of the outside experience at camp led me to believe: How do you bring that into? I didn't know how to do that, and so we created an entity, and others did, which I think have infused back. Uh, not quite enough, but I think it's. Uh, there's been progress on that front. Is there anything else you want to add at this point? Um, Great privilege to uh, spend this time being able to share th at least my take on this chapter of uh, the Chavarot and American Jewish life. Thank you, John. It's been absolutely wonderful. My pleasure. My pleasure.